Hey, uh, thanks for calling uh, Parmesan's Interplanetary Pizza Delivery Service. Uh, what can I get for you today there? Uh-huh. Uh-huh, 50,000 people. Yeah, you need 50,000 50, pies for where? Zoll? Uh -huh. Zoll, 50,000 pies for Zoll? I think, let me just check. Yeah, I can probably do that. No, it'll take me about a week, though. I'll get you, get you back in a week. Is that good? That's all good? All right, thank you very much. Thanks. All right, bye. Time to get down to making those pies for the day. Repeat, the Goriath satellite has lost orbit and is expected to crash into Parma within the week. All citizens are to evacuate the planet. Ah, fuck this news. I'm changing that shit right now. Okay, this is some sweet, sweet tunes right now while I'm working. You can tell by the way I use my walk. I'm a pizza guy. No time to talk. All right, and that's the last pizza done. I just got to get them all into the freight fucking transport fucking dealy because fuck it. Let's, let's go. All right, and they're loaded. All right, that's all the fucking pizza. Hey, man, you got to freaking move it. Let me in. Let me hey, in. hey, guy, fuck off. Get away from me. Don't touch that. No, we got to go. Like, where's the controls? Okay. Hey, what the fuck? What are we doing in the air? What the hell's going on? Who the hell are you people? The Gyrus satellite's gonna crash into Parma. It's gonna wipe it out. Nah, fuck you. I don't listen to any of that fake, st stupid fucking fake news shit. Fuck that. There's no blowing up Parma. You guys are idiots. Why don't you look at that camera right there? Holy actual shit. I hadn't paid off my last premium on my car yet. <laughs> That's fucked. All right, well, we gotta go make some money. I gotta drop these pies off. I, I don't know what you guys are doing, but, like, fuck you guys. I gotta do this. What, what are you talking about? We have to evacuate to Motavia. Holy fuck, are you drinking while you're flying this goddamn spaceship, you drunk asshole? Fuck this, I'm out of here. I'm a little stressed out. <laughs> I just saw my planet get blown up, man. Kept me some damn slack. You know what, fuck this. I'm going to sleep. Fuck you guys. Okay, so all I gotta do is fuck around with these nav controls here, and I can just change the course a little bit, and then we can make this delivery before I get caught. And that ought to do it. What the hell? What are you doing in here? Ah, fuck you guys. I'm changing the course. Get get out of here. That's not even the navigational controls. That's the clamps for the fuel tanks. What? What do you mean? Clamps for the fuel tanks? Why the fuck would there be clamps for the fuel tanks? That's the stupidest shit I ever heard. So they can be exchanged for, like... So that they can be refueled separate from the ship. Oh my fuck, I mean, you, we're only running on a single tank of fuel now instead of the 14 we had. We won't even be able to land properly. We don't have anything for the retro jets. You, try you fucked us, man. We're going to be stuck in orbit. You trying to tell me that there's a release clamp for the fucking fuel tanks and now we're going to be stuck in orbit because we don't have enough fuel? That's exactly what I just said. Are you not fucking paying attention to me? <laughs> fuck, we're screwed. Don't fucking touch my pizzas. If we starve, oh. I'm eating you first. Oh, not if we eat you first, you son of a bitch. Yeah, fuck you. You can bring it on. You have to fight me. <laughs> ah! Gamer needs food badly. Let's -a go! Hey everybody, welcome back to the taste test for what it is.
<laughs> Mike just had a small stroke and forgot how our intro goes. No, Brandon just blew <laughs> a fart into the microphone. So, uh, yeah, we're presenting a very special episode in video audio format. Woo! No video for you, though. Only video it for might me. might add this video. I'm not recording yeah, it. Yeah, we might add some of this video. I'm not recording it, so we won't. Mike might edit it. <laughs> what? <laughs> you might as well. I can't record... I mean, it's hilarious. I, because... I don't know how to record Skype video. Only the audio. You could have asked if you were uh, going to ad-lib some of that shit. Right. I, you're ad-libbing. I'm just it was a thing. But I did. Yeah, so... This is why you pay me. Uh, <laughs> this is why I pay you 50% of what we make on the you, show. You could have mentioned that you... This is why I get 1% of what we don't make. <laughs> um, also, you could have mentioned that you weren't able to record video because you led me to believe that you could record everything mm. by saying audio that's your fault that's my fault yeah. for letting you assume and also i could have yeah yeah you know me it's your fault um, y'all know me also, same old g to see if there's a fucking but i've been low-key yeah. hanging yeah. on since all these motherfuckers <laughs> gonna crawl from my back for groceries uh, now you're done <laughs> well did you forget about me no, you could have fucking told me that you can't record video, and then I could have found a thing to record the video on my new phone. That would have wasted too much time. I gotta fucking record now. Vamoose, let's go. Andale, andale. So. Mm, give me one more half second. Give me one more half second. Beep. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. No, you don't have to beep. <laughs> I'm just, just. <laughs> add some filler. Tell me about your day, Mike. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to driving today. Gonna be driving, I don't know, Kingston... Maybe. Just hitting the road, getting some road experience. You're doing to get a my road GTA. trip? Getting some XPs. You're farming XP, right? Yeah, I'm going to be farming XP. Hoping to level up. You're grinding. To my G2. You are literally grinding because eventually your car will stop working. <laughs> You're driving an automatic, basically, right? Yeah. You're not man enough to drive a safety. I don't think my testicular fortitude will I change... Know. The configuration of my mom's vehicle. It's not like I can will it to be a stick. No, but but if you grew up on a farm and had a pair of testicles or something, then maybe you'd know how to drive standard, and that would be implemented by your old man. Hmm. But I know that you're a city boy. Also, the headphones means that my computer can hear me, which I just remembered. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, the good times. Uh, Brandon. Where's our fucking... We're only, um, what, 11 episodes in, and you're only figuring out the basic functions of your recording equipment. We're not 11 episodes in, are we? Isn't Batman our 11th episode? We gotta be... I stopped numbering them. <laughs> this summer, Dodongo <laughs> 2... <laughs> The yeah, Batman Returns was our 11th episode. This is our 12th. Yeah, it says that right there. I'm reading it now. I can't find our fucking script, though. We don't have a script. I blame you. <laughs> We're doing this oh, ad lib because of you. the future plans text. Well, there's some amount of preparation. Is, I say that. Is this going to be our... <laughs> very, uh... Is this going to be our long intro or our long outtake? <laughs> and you're back in the kitchen with Game Connoisseur, Mike King. King. I forgot your last name. <laughs> <laughs> Mike the Mad King. <laughs> oh, shit. That That's what keeps me. coming up on your fucking Facebook and it's really irritating to me because it bothers my brain. And my. Like, he's not mad. He's just regular. And my. Dysfunctional event. And my host, Brandon Boswell. The chef. Your chef host. The chef host, yes. I cook food. <laughs> yes. Yo, I've honestly done more dishes this season than I've done in my entire life. I'm about to kill something. <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, good. I, I brought my papers. I thought I must have missed that. Yeah, Brandon's going to be smoking live. Because fuck this. I, I always smoke live. Because fuck this episode. No. <laughs> so. Fuck Fantasy Star 4, yeah. first off. 
But not fuck this episode. Yeah. Mike, can I, like, so you're telling me that we have no way to get this video footage that I'm giving you right now. This wonderful footage of me rolling. The, like, I'm doing this for the viewers. At the moment, I don't know how to record Skype, and I don't want to spend any more time looking it up because we uh, fucking postponed, procrastinated, delayed, and abrogated, and any really fucking big words that mean it didn't happen yet. And I'm tired of it. It's getting done. We can look up research and shit All right. later, but not now. Brandon, there will always be more right. drugs. Okay, so this is this is a special episode where what we're going to do is Mike's going to tell me the plot of this game because I haven't had time to play it because I've been cooking and washing the, too many dishes. I swear to God, I've washed so many yep. dishes. And, uh, so this is my one day off, and Mike's going to spend it with me telling me the story, and then I'm going to get to react to it so he can see it. Maybe we'll figure out a way for you guys to see it later. It's story time with... But that's going to be our special episode. It's story time with little Brandon and Uncle Mike. Yeah, I have an Uncle Mike. I think I told you that when we were hanging out. So, who recommend... Anyway. So, Brandon, who recommended this game? (laughs) Ben (laughs) told us about this game. Uh, He's a prick, and he said that this was going to be like a milestone game for us. So, we got a few episodes in, and then we did it. And, and then he's like, hey, now it's time for you guys to do this, this fucking game. And I don't want to do it. It's really shitty. I honestly tried to play it. Like, this, is, this is my experience. I'm going to give you the quick rundown. So I, I booted it up on the computer. Hey, chipmunk. Hi, friend. Hey, buddy. I booted it up on the computer. Hey, there was no chipmunk food. in the game, it's by just, the way. It's just weed. Yeah. I don't know. You're bummed out. There's a chipmunk um, in the studio with Brandon. In, in the studio, he's actually yeah, looking the at the car hole. <laughs> he's, anyway, he's in the so, safety of his garage compound, and somehow a chipmunk yeah. came in looking for sustenance. The only thing Brandon has to offer him is a different type of leafy green that he probably wouldn't agree with. Yeah, and that, I'm not a fan of sharing. But anyway, so <laughs> I started it up. Uh, I was at work. I fired it up. I. Spent like 20 minutes pushing A to get through all the fucking talking that they do. And then eventually the game actually started. And I was sent to go find some principal prick in the school that I was in. And I literally went to every prick that I could find and couldn't initiate some conversation with the principal. So I had to quit. And then I had to go back to work. So that's as far as I got. Um, For about four weeks. For about four weeks. I tried doing it a couple more times but never got further than that. First attempt was the best attempt. Um, so Mike is going to be so gracious as to tell me the story. And that's our plan. Yeah, but first we're going to preface our game with a proper introduction. Sure. Fantasy Star 4 is a role-playing game released for the Mega Drive Genesis in Japan in 1993 and in Europe and North America in 1995. It is the fourth and final game of the original Fantasy Star series, concluding the story of the Algol Star system. What? But if you want to play it more recently, it was made available for the Wii Virtual Console in Japan in two twenty. On the 24th of June, 2008. Yep, not in the future. In PAL. In the past. And in North America on December 22nd, 2008 for 800 Wii points. Really? Why did they come up with these points instead of just saying, it's five bucks, man? Well, 
Are we points earnable? So fantasy star. Hold on, hold on. Are we points earnable or are they bought only purchasable? Uh, I think they're purchasable, like PlayStation points. Yeah, so then that's your reason. Or uh, Microsoft points. Yeah, fucking wiener. That's the reason why right there. Yeah. If they're earnable, then they're idiots. No. Because there's people farming for them. But if you have to purchase them, then they're just an arbitrary it, it unit of be. money. Yeah, so why not just skip that phase and... I mean, think of all the people in the staff they had to hire to make this system of trade when you could have just said, you know what, give us money. Yeah, but imagine, like, the real world without money. Like, frankly, I hate all money. So when they make that arbitrary, like, level of extra money, it doesn't make a difference to me. It's still money. So imagine the world without the money. Imagine going to the movies and you're like... you. Imagine going to the movies and you're like, fuck, man, put your, put your bills away. We only accept Cineplex points here. Yeah, that would be exactly the same as going to any other country. And then you go, and then and the then you go to Harvey's. And like, no, nah, no, nah, put that away. We like, only accept you, Swedish we only accept Harvey's points. money. <laughs> that would be the exact same thing, which is exactly what Didn't happens. Didn't they all go to the Euro? I don't know. A Franco or something. <clears throat> It's not like any of us will be able to afford to go to Europe. A France for a I assume. Anyway, it says, Fantasy Star 4 kept many of the gameplay elements of the previous game, including turn-based battles, overhead exploration, and magic spells. The game was met with mixed to positive reviews, has been subject to very positive critical retrospective reviews, and has appeared on several lists of all-time best games. And as you can already tell, Brandon is not really on board with that assumption or assertion yeah it's definitely a bullshit lie if you want to talk about all-time games you can go get any fucking bullet shooter and play it and that's like what and then this game is like hours of just talking and i'm I'm not even talking about like dialogue like like spoken audio words just dialogue you you might as well just have a book that you push next on i'm pretty sure kindle is the next best thing in its (laughs) defense in its defense I will say I like the cutscenes because it actually had like panels that would show up on screen like a comic book. So I really enjoyed that part. Yeah, I might. And I like the expanded script and the manga style illustrations. I'm going to write this down, my idea that I just had. Um, but I'm going to bring this up my substitutions. But yeah. Okay, well, so I can go on there oh, right yeah. now. I was gonna, I was gonna bring it up. Why not? So, here's the plot: Fantasy Star Four takes place a thousand years after the events of Fantasy Star Two. After an event called the Great Collapse, much of the once thriving planet Motavia has been reduced to desert, and life has become progressively more difficult. Fuck, not Motavia. To make matters worse, there's been an increase in an. I'm a- I'm adding my fucking emotions. <laughs> I, I miss Motavia. Increase. I don't know anything about it, but I'm already addicted to it. <laughs> I, okay, there's been an increase in bio monsters, a catch-all term for the strange and violent aberrations of Motavia's flora and Did it seriously and say... Hold on, hold Keeping on. Keeping these creatures under hey, control is the job of... seriously say a catch-all term? Huh. That's yes. pretty fucking good. Keeping these creatures under control is the job of hunters. During an investigation into such an outbreak, Chaz uh-huh. Ashley, which really, I mean, this guy sounds like the, this guy sounds like the fourth member of he's a boy two band of the, he's who's two appearing of the three at your local members. Mall. That's what he is. <laughs> okay, he's a young hunter, learns of the relationship between the biomonster problem and the planet's ecological crisis. The planet is in the process of returning to its original desert state as the terraforming devices that were installed over a thousand years ago are beginning to fail. The reasons behind these malfunctions are clarified as the plot unfolds, directly relating to the events of Fantasy Star 2. There was Fantasy Star 2. That shit happened. Nobody cares what the fuck that shit includes. Then, a thousand years later, some fuck-off planet that's supposed to be rich with life just starts dying and whatever, and then they're like, uh, yeah, we also noticed that there's a bunch of these weird, uh, like, critters that are, like, mutating from our wildlife and, 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 you know, plant life. We're gonna call them all bio-whatevers. What was it? <laughs> it bio-monsters. Bio yeah, monsters. that's super creative. 
We're going to call them all bio monsters and not categorize them. Yeah. Really. And then also uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to freak the fuck out because oh, really what's happening is that the planet is returning to what it should have been when it was rotating around the rocks and shit that it's near. We actually showed up at some point and fucked it up by putting life on it. And now we're all going to freak out. That's what I'm getting out of this. Pretty okay. much. So, Chaz and his allies connect the world's troubles to a cult leader called Zeo, yep. the Black Magician, whose aim appears to be total annihilation, not only of Motavia, but the entire why solar there, system. Dickhead? The hero stops Zeo to why, restore... Why stop at the entire solar system? Is this... Like, what's this universe about? Is it just one solar system? <laughs> I don't think he... I don't think he... That's fucked. Yeah. I don't think he has the ability to travel beyond the solar system, so he just wants to eliminate that. <laughs> That's what I have to say about Zol. He, you know, he thinks globally, so but acts locally. Like What's his name? <laughs> Zia? Solda? Zia. His name is Zia when he his name is Zia when he oh, dances yeah. on the sand. <laughs> Literally, because he's on a desert planet. I get it. A planet that should be a desert, but they all fucked it up by putting planets so on it. Seems... it. Yeah. Yeah, by putting grass and plants and shit on it. Yeah. Thanks, Obama. So. <coughs> Anyways, I won't spoil the rest of the uh, assumption because we're going to be reading it. Because Brandon did not, or did not get to, and you can put that get to in parentheses. Because he probably had a moment or two, but chose not to. After being very dissuaded. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> by oh, being... fuck you. <laughs> had a moment too don't make me fucking lay out my day for you on the schedule you want me to get a fitbit that you can record is that what you want brandon i noticed you're not moving for the last 10 minutes i'm taking a shit fuck off that's that's perfect video watching time brandon are you watching that video yeah fucking leave me alone mike yeah you could have been watching a, you could have been watching a playthrough video for the last 10 minutes fuck off mike I'm, I'm, I'm taking a shit and jerking off because you don't give me free time. I'm, I'm fucking multi-masturbating task. <laughs> Master tasking. <laughs> I'm tasturbating. <laughs> All right. Get out of my life. <laughs> okay, so... You're worse than my parole officer. <laughs> so the game begins with Chaz hanging out with his instructor slash mentor, Alice. Now, it says, now, yeah. you got to the point where they were looking for the principal. So, it yeah. says, you'll find the principal's office behind the middle door on the top floor, which is probably the, the one place you didn't Good. look. And now here's where it begins. Ah, uh, yeah. We get a cut. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. To correct you, to, to correct you, the one place I didn't look was in a fucking walkthrough because <laughs> I'm not about that life. Fucking hate that. And I want our viewers to know every time I've used a walkthrough, I admitted it and fucking hated it. Uh, so this is Brandon being... Mostly because it required me to read. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly because I had to read it and I hate that life. <laughs> and about it. So he's making me but do it. Also because... Yeah. <laughs> that, that. Right there. Because Mike, you can do it. Okay, so they find the principal in the place Brandon did not look, and he explains that the Academy basement has been taken over by monsters. He wishes Chaz and Alice to destroy them. When asked how the monsters got there in the first place, 
First place, the principal takes on a different tone, shouting, he doesn't know, and they should just get on with it. When they leave, Alice tells Chaz she thinks the principal was acting very suspiciously, and Chaz feels he may just be afraid of the monsters. You make your way downstairs through the door behind the statue to find yourself at the entrance to the basement. Speak to the student guarding the stairs to begin another cutscene. The student, whose name is Han, requests that he goes with you, explaining his mentor, Professor Holt, went missing while researching a place called Birth Valley. Which I have to imagine is like a- Hold on, we're gonna- hold on. Well, okay, you- you imagine your thing first, I'll come back to it. I imagine Birth Valley is like a is like two large mountains angled against each other looking like a- like a pair of legs. With a large cave in the middle. Okay, I should have gone first. I realize I should have gone first now. Oh my god. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to say, this guy Han, he just wants to come with you because his master was what? His master's gone missing while researching Birth Valley. You know what? Fuck Han. Tell that guy he can come with you, wait until you get around the corner, shiv him in the back of the neck, take all his shit. I don't trust that fucker. <laughs> I don't, I don't care what the fuck you're about to tell me. I bet you he's about to do a bunch of really valuable character trait shit, and I bet you at the end of the game he fucks me over somehow. <laughs> I'll say so. I don't he, like that. He feels that there's a connection and he wants to find the truth, but he was waiting for Chaz and Alice to arrive since he didn't want to go into the basement alone. And since he's a pussy, he was right. Oh, he was waiting. Yeah. Yeah, he was waiting. So he was. He was just standing there... Looking at them, looking. How the, at the fuck did he know that they were going down? He was just waiting for somebody to show up, waiting to, with the balls to go down there. Then he was going to tag along with them. That's. <laughs> no, shut the fuck up and stay here. Brandon has Those are most, your options. Brandon has the most if you beautiful go into perplexed that... face. <laughs> <laughs> if honestly, I get, I just got told I'm going into a basement to go fight some fucking monsters. There's a dude at the door, and he's like, "I was gonna go." But I'm a fat. I just. I'm afraid. I can't do it. Uh, can I come with you, though? Nope. You can stay the fuck here. Uh, Alice, you, if you come in that door with me, I'm going to kill you immediately. And if not, I might let you live long enough to be a human shield for whatever the fuck's in there. Those are your options. <laughs> Alice finds the third option, which is letting him tag along for 100 Mazada, which is the unit of currency. And you actually gain the currency. So he bribes you. Oh, he pays me? Yeah. So, you... So he's basically... See, the thing about that is, like, I don't trust this guy, so he's paying me, and if he kills me, he just gets his money plus my money, which he already had. So he's not losing anything by giving me this money, and that doesn't earn him anything in my book of trust. <laughs> I can't spend this money while I'm in this dungeon, right? Like, I'd have to, like, turn around and go back to a store and then spend the money? Yeah, but it's in the same town, so you don't have to go too far. So you go through the But I couldn't even. Like I couldn't accept his money and then turn around, right, in the game. This is a, this is going to be probably like a accept first, his money and then continue. This is going to be like a first 3 hour episode. And I, I I don't I may not have a problem with that. It'll be the perfect fuck you to Ben for suggesting this. Isn't this is our first 3 hour <laughs> Ben <laughs> bastard. This is what you get for picking an RPG. <laughs> We're going to play it live where <laughs> Mike reads the story and I fucking tell him my opinions. And he tells me, no, nah, it doesn't matter because the story goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> so you end up going through the basement. You find a room full of test tubes and monsters inside them. And you fight the first boss of the right. game, something called Iglanova. Uh. Although, like, I'd like to know, like, why it has yeah. that name when it doesn't, it can't speak or announce itself. So how the hell do you know what it's called? So you end up fighting this monster and yeah. uh, you get to really... Use Alice's I don't have an techniques answer for that. and skills. Like, I don't know what to tell you. And the monster will yeah. spawn a little mini monster that you've been fighting throughout the basement already, <coughs> until there's two on the screen, and you can basically use these guys to uh, boost up your experience a lot by just taking out the scrubs. So once and letting them respawn them again. Yep. So once take them out, respawn, take them out, respawn, and just keep yep. the boss alive in the middle. Yep. Well, you can That's like good. you can chip away. What's what's Han doing? He's a, he's a healer. And when the battle's over, Alice will ask Han why all the capsules are there, and he will state he doesn't know. They decide to see the principal, so return up the stairs, make your way out of the basement. Visit the principal's room, speak to him. 
Alice will ask him why all the capsules are there and after a little persuasion he tells her. Apparently the new breed of monster that has emerged in the area originated from Birth Valley so Professor Holt went to investigate. The principal tells Alice that Holt had found evidence of an ancient and advanced civilization and he brought back the breeding capsules to be studied before setting out to Birth Valley again. But this time he didn't return. Han asks why the principal didn't send a rescue team, so the principal replies that he was visited by a man who called himself Zeo. Bum bum bum! A flashback ensues, where you see Zeo warning the principal not to send anyone to Birth Valley, on pain of being turned to stone. Han then resolves to go to Birth Valley, and Alice kindly informs him that it's an egg-laying season for sandworms. She, f she agrees to accompany him for 300 Mazada, because this girl is all about the hustle. Han then says that Birth Valley is to the northeast, and you gain 300 Mazada. I don't fucking trust Han. I don't, I don't fucking trust that cunt. Let's go to the fucking so you make Birth your Valley, way. and I'm going to give you 300 bucks because I'm going to keep paying you to trust me, which doesn't make any fucking sense, because I still haven't spent this money. And even if I do spend this money, you can still steal the thing that I fucking bought. Like, if you kill me, you get my armor. And every time he heals me... Oh, you're not going to buy armor. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> you, one, said armor. Two, I was thinking, like, buying weapons or amulets or whatever. But you can still take them. Anyway, uh, every time he heals me, I'm taking that healing begrudgingly. I just want that to be clear. <laughs> okay, so you go through this village of Zima, which is just south of a mountain range. As you go through there, there is no store. Of Zima? Zema. Like they all have a skin rash? <laughs> Eczema. Zema? <laughs> so you go through... So it's, it's, it's old Valyria. <laughs> so you go through the town of Zema, but they there is no store, scale. there is no anything... Because everyone has been turned to stone, that means Zeo's been here, and he's so it's the it's it's old Valeria. <laughs> it's Game of Thrones. Yeah, okay. Here, man. I'm so on board with Thrones. George R. R. Martin. I'm on board, man. Game. I'm I'm in. All right, Brandon has now finally got some emotion. Hey, side note. This game. Yeah, a little bit. So, side note also though, uh, I'm real pissed off about my standing in the fucking um, in the what you call it. <laughs> Um, you were doing good. What, what's we're, it part, the yeah, we're part of a fantasy. fantasy. I was doing real good. We're part of a fantasy league on Game of Thrones where we pick five characters, and depending on what they achieve in the game, they're given points, or if they suffer a demotion, they actually have points taken away from them. And I am. <laughs> <laughs> to say dominating would be an understatement. I have like a like smoking ass. I have a three hundred point spread on Sheldon, the host of the Graveyard Shift, and he's three hundred points behind me and at second place. <laughs> I have like five hundred and fifty points. I'm, My uh... team is consisting of Jamie Lannister and Arya Stark. Three other people. Uh, first was Obara Sand, who got got me fifty points by dying memorably and then Brant and then Arya and Jamie have just been killing or sister banging their way to the top of the rankings and I'm just happy as a yeah, you're I'm perfect. happy as a I, I ended up getting mine automatically chosen <laughs> <laughs> who's on, who's 99 percent of mine were automatically chosen who's on your team? I got some guy named corn corn who the fuck is that <laughs> Does he name his horse Cobb? I've got, okay. I, I, I don't even know. Corn what, on the Cobb? I don't even react to that. <laughs> okay, so what I've got, listen, what I've got is uh, Mountain, Brienne, uh, uh, Giant Spain, Th Tormon or whatever, and I got Karstark, Alia or whatever, Elia, Karstark. Alia, Aria, Karstark. And I got Corn. Yeah. Yeah, Corner, I think his name is. Corner. I think you got some points because Arya Karstark did bend the knee to the king. So wait, do you get points for bending? I've got, knee? I've got like literally, I don't know. I have no idea how the fuck the points work. I've read it like a hundred times and I never retain the information. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, I've got like sixty points. I know that, but like I was doing real good in the first episode, and then I just ate ass <laughs> immediately after that. Just <laughs> fucking garbage. And I'm like, this is fucking shit. I've listened to like this whole other podcast called Binge Mode to try to catch up and, and figure out like if my picks are any good because like I said the computer randomly picked half of my guys. Like I picked Brianna and I picked the mountain and then all the other ones were randoms. 
I think I no, it gave me Kara Stark too. So all of them are like three of my team are just random draft picks, and I know that I can trade them, but I don't really give a fuck to trade. Brianna and the, I'm not gonna wait around. Brianna and, and the Mountain were good picks because they've established themselves as serial killing badasses, but they've done fuck all this season, leaving yeah, you and in also, the dust. Yeah, and I've also got Giants Bane. Tormont Giants Bane, which I thought they were going to fuck. And I was like, yeah, get your bang on, and then I can get some points. That'd be sweet. You get some sex But points. they're just not fucking because Bran is... Yeah, because Bran's a cold stone killer. And, you know, she ain't got, too busy training. She, she right. ain't got time to catch feelings. Spoiler alert! <laughs> <laughs> I want him to bang. Uh, we can we can say that in our podcast now. Spoiler yeah. alert! Did you see? We finally are on a topic that isn't from the fucking nineties. <laughs> Did you see that video of like the two action figures of them making out? It was in the chat. John sent the chat. Know, it was yeah. just like this. It was the two action figures of Brienne and Tormund just like walking up to each other and like. <laughs> and then when it zooms out, it's the actor who plays Tormund holding the dolls, and he looks at the camera like. Oh, shit. And then he goes away. Back to the game. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, they're like, hey, let's go to fucking Birth Valley, right? Yeah. That's a good place to go. And, on the uh, way there, they pass... Dickhead's like, I'll pay you if you let me hang out with And you. on the way there, they pass through a town proving that, Z- that Zio did make good on his threat, and he can, in fact, turn an entire city to stone. So when you get to Birth okay. Valley, that's not cool. When you get to Birth Valley, you find once again everybody there is in fact turned to stone. But as you make your way to the cave of Birth Valley, you see Professor Holt. And Han is shocked by his petrification and asks if there's any way to undo what's been done. Alice then speaks of a medicine she heard of called Alshine. Alshine, which is supposed to turn stone to flesh. I wonder if that like I hope it means like turns it back to flesh. And that, you know, just, like, pour it on rocks and watch them turn into, like, big fleshy fat uh, on piles. On rocks? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that's terrifying. <laughs> oh, man. You know the dude that invented that just wanted to fuck some rocks? <laughs> no. The dude that invented that way back when was like, cut... you know it would be great if these rocks were real titties? I can't cut a slit into them with my knife, but if I could turn these rocks into flesh, one, they'd feel better, and two, I could cut them and get a nice slit going on. <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm sure he finds rocks that already look like way too much like, you know, phallic and vaginal symbols, and then he just like turns them into flesh. Oh. And fucks them as they are. <laughs> oh my god, you don't want to let this guy near a quarry. So anyway, he inform she informs him that it used to be available. Ah. <laughs> are you looking at the fucking camera or what? I'm. Tr- How can I look at the camera while I'm reading the story to you? Oh my gosh, is that a potato gun? Or a hoe? Oh, it's a hose. It's it's a Nerf pistol. (sighs) Yeah. No, it's a Nerf pistol. Yeah, that's great. I didn't have that until a second ago. So it used to be... Listen. Mm. Yes? Quit fucking mugging at the camera. That's just the face I was doing before. (laughs) He's just looking... Hey, that's the face I was doing before that I wanted you to... He's just looking all fucking cute at me like... "Eh?" That's my blue steel, baby. <laughs> so anyway, she informs him it used to be available at the Motavian town of Mulcombe, far to the south. Han suggests they set off, and Alice enough. Alice is nice enough to set the price of accompaniment at 500 Mazada. She keeps bleeding his fucker dry, and I, and I bet you're completely behind her on this. No, I don't fucking trust this cut. Don't even bother taking his money. Just, like, have him walk eight paces ahead of you with your sword out at all times if he really wants to come that bad. Okay. And then, but grudgingly take his healing. So, you go to the town of Malcolm to find it in ruins. All the buildings have been burnt down. There seems to be nobody around either. You head north through the village until you see a man dressed no in... No rock people? No, they're not even rocks. They're just fucking burnt up. Okay. That's a new thing that we can add to the file. That's a different thing. Yeah, right? well, apparently... Well, if the cure for stone is in there... You don't want to put people into stone now, will you? But nobody has the cure for being burned what? alive. Remember this. I'll... I thought they did. They not find it, or do they just know about it? Well, we don't know because nobody's there to tell us because they all got burnt up. So Mulcom is in ruins. Oh. You find a man dressed in white facing away from you. Approach him and speak to him to begin a cutscene. 
Alice seems to know the man and calls him Rune. He greets her, and then he and Chaz have a little squabble. Alice breaks it up and asks what happened. Rune explains that Zeal burned the village down. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So this guy got, like, blue hair? Yeah. He's wearing, like, a white robe? Yeah, I seen that dude. I, I looked at some memes of this fucking dumbass game. <laughs> There's memes. So... That room, dude. Zeo burned the village down. He's been up to a lot recently. Han then cuts in by asking how they're going to get the Alshline, and Rune suggests they go to Tanoe. He gives directions that takes the party past a village called Krupp. Han seems averse into going into this particular place. Rune then invites himself into the group, but Chaz isn't happy with it. He gets fed up with Rune calling him Shorty, but before he can say what his name is, Rune says that he already ha heard that his name was Chaz. Then Rune joins the party. I don't hate Rune. <laughs> what is his thing, though? What does he do? Does he attack, or is he... He's like an attack healing mage. Which is which is better than Han, because he's just like a like a wimpy medic. So anyway, you you head to the village of Krupp. I don't hate him. Yep. Oh, good, Krupp. I can't wait. Yep. And then you find this is Han's village. You go to his parents' house, and his father owns the store. He's annoyed with his son because Han wastes his time studying when he should be helping with the family business. Now you know why Han wanted to avoid this place. You go into the building north of town, you'll find yourself in a classroom. Han races over and embraces the teacher. This is Saya, it turns out she's Han's fiance. A conversation ensues between everyone, after which you leave. So that's Hold just on. a nice little bit go of flavor. Go back to the shop. Hold on, go back to the shop. So when you're in the shop with Han's dad, can you buy stuff? Yeah, but it doesn't look like you get a family discount. He, he, but he's got some you money. still get to use all of the money that Han gave you? Yeah. So if Han kills me at some point, he can take all the shit that I buy with the money, which I already said he could do, <laughs> and he can just go back to his dad's shop? Yeah, he could, except he, he's a complete pussy and he has no ability to do this. We're not talking about intent anymore. This man has demonstrated no ability to cause damage. That's exactly what somebody would want you to think if they were going to fuck you over. <laughs> the conspiracy of Han continues. Can he literally not actually attack in the game? Like he doesn't have that function or something? Uh, I think he has like... A, he literally can only... He has like a minimal attack. Like he can attack like with like a, a rod. <clears throat> but it was, it's like the least amount of a damage in the game. Or something. Yeah, it's the least amount of damage in the game. Yeah. I think he has like a... That's fine. That's still like he's got motive and he's got opportunity. <laughs> one of the other two things that I think opportunity. <laughs> so does he have what, means, what's the last thing? What's the last thing? Means motive and opportunity. Means. No, he has means. He has means. Yeah. He doesn't have opportunity Some yet. Some folks got hopes and dreams. We got ways and means. Shh, stop rapping, you're too white. You live in Ottawa. It's white there all the time. <laughs> anyway. Honestly, dude, the time that I spent there was just like a gray haze. <laughs> Fuck that place. I don't mind it, but it's got way too much like big buildings, politicians and We never got to hang out like at the cool places like the We never got to hang out at the cool places like the blurry pixel, escape rooms, you know, just go walking along the bike paths the and the nature. Atari you know, I did the, I did the bike path a little. Not with me. Yeah, what do you want from you me? I'm broke. I work all the time. If you work all the time, you want to be broke. Yeah. I mean, one is supposed to. I do work all the time. I'm still the, broke. One is supposed to cancel out the other. That's how work works. They pay you. I mean, Are you looking at the camera? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, you go to a place that was. Because I was I was saying that because that's what I spent all my money on. So you meet this old man named Doran. He replies that they can take whatever they need and that the Alshline is in the warehouse in the back. They're about to leave when Doran warns it might be a tad Say risky. what? Yeah, there's a weird... This guy's just like, yeah, have whatever you need. There's a town full of, like, these weird beast folk in it. They look like bugs. But, like, big furry bugs. But they're friendly. Good... So, oh, the le okay. so the leader says the Oshline is in the warehouse in the back, but it's a bit risky since I guess like they let the monsters overrun it because they have no need to go back there. So they send one of their own, 
a guy called Grizz. And he's like, he basically looks like, uh, what the fuck is that uh, bug Pokemon uh, that turns into a moth? A Venonat? You know, he's like a cute little round bug no, with like, shiny of, eyes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about, um, a Venonat might be close. The one that turns into like Butterfree. No, that's Caterpie. So anyway, Grizz, moth, Grizz comes along there. with you. And yeah, yeah, and uh, Rune leaves the party at this point, telling Chaz not to get any silly ideas about taking on Zeo yet. This surprises the group as the idea right. of Chaz fighting Zeo hadn't even come up yet. Alice thanks Rune, and then he fucks off. Rune leaves the party, Grizz joins the party, and Grin is like your big tank. He deals a lot of damage. Doesn't have much in the way of... Uh, Wait, what's his name? Grizz. What? Grizz? I thought it was Briz. Starts with a G, man. G-R-I-Z. G-R-Y-Z. G-R-Y-Z. Okay. So you go to the storage facility. You end up getting through a whole bunch of monsters. You find the Al Schlein. Alice takes the medicine, after which Grizz requests joining the group, as it turns out his father and mother were killed by Zeo when his village was burned down. Chaz points out they're not necessarily going after Zeo, to which, bring, to which Grizz brings up what Rune said earlier. Either way, Grizz wants to go as he's getting bored of staying in Tanoe. Alice agrees, and Han impatiently suggests they leave. I think Han might be a little bent out of shape because Alice isn't charging Grizz. But then anyway, it says, you Maybe. can now <laughs> you can now head back to Zema. And once you're in Zema, walk in to begin a lengthy cutscene. The party will use the Alshline to restore the residents of Zema and the research team. Professor Holt is glad to see Han, although he has no recollection of what happens. What happened? He instructs Han to go back to the academy and tell them what happened, and that he's off to further explore Birth Valley. With this problem over with, the group decide to take it easy for the rest of the day. Han decides to return to Piata, and Grizz resolves to go after Zeo alone if he has to. Alice suggests that she and Chaz go back to the Hunter's Guild in Aedo, when suddenly there's a scream. The group rushes over to the entrance to Birth Valley to find another Iglanova blocking their path. You're immediately flung into battle. <laughs> So after you be because super good. The, yep, and it's the same one you fought before. So wait, 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 wait. Who's in who's in this fight with us? It's us, Alice. Alice? Chaz. It's Chaz is us. Yeah. And uh it doesn't specify Did Grisby take off? Yeah, Hunt returned to Piata and Grizz, I think he left to go after Zeo alone. So, yeah, it's just you and okay. Alice, except your levels have gone up, so this monster is the exact same and incredibly easy. So, Chaz becomes curious about what's further inside. Han realizes the professor went inside and may be surrounded by monsters, so Alice is kind enough to let him join for the fair price of 1,000 Mazada. So it looks like Han won't be getting married for a while. <laughs> you know, if he does want to kill That's this group, amazing. you know... If your theory does hold true that he wants to kill this group, I think Alice is the reason why. Yeah, she's definitely, like, helping him have no reason not to. <laughs> but also, I don't give a fuck. Like, I'd just be like, fine, take the money. I, like, uh, like if you don't pay her, I'm not even going to argue. I uh, just don't give a fuck. Walk <laughs> in front of me. So you end up going through the cave, which leads to a new area called a bio plant. 
Go through the first corridor. A little right. along the way, a red light will flash. Ch- Chaz and Han are terrified, but Alice calms them down. You find a panel on the wall, and it says, Sterilization treatment completed. Please follow the line on the floor. And as you head through these corridors, saying, West section, unauthorized entry, and elevator to the central block. You end up... Uh, it says you eventually find Professor Holt and it begins a cutscene. The professor is fine and he's been aided by a pink haired stranger. She introduces herself as Rika and explains that they are in a research facility for genetic engineering built over a thousand years ago. Han asks if the place is still operational and Rika replies that it is. And also it's not the only one of its kind. There are many systems on like this that control the planet's ecology, soil and climate conditions. The professor asks if that is the case, why such problems have occurred recently. She explains the system has lost control and suggests that you speak to Seed for more information. Rika and Professor Holt disappear through the door above. Follow them through. Rika will introduce you to Seed, the control computer for the bioplant. The scholars are impressed. Seed warns the party that the monster outbreak was caused here, and that if things are left to continue, the planet will be destroyed. Alice suggests they shut down the system, but Han is dubious about the problem this may cause for the planet. Gruz points out wisely that no system is better than one that's ruining everything. Chaz notes that to do that will require each system being shut down, but Rika cuts it by saying that only the control system Nervous must be turned off. C tells the group that in order well, to shut down let's Nervous... let's fucking do it. Yep, they will have to shut... They will need to rescue Demi, an android being held hostage by Zeo at Zeo's fort since she's like the control interface nope. for this system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they nope. warned us. Yeah, the guy warned us, don't fuck with Zeo. Nope. Nope. You know what? Fucking get some grenades. Go to the fucking core of this bitch. Put them on it. Leave. Problem solved. I think you've been playing too much Black Ops. You can't solve everything. You've been everything. playing too much Black Ops. I'm just you, can't solve, you can't solve everything I'm just by attaching assuming a block that of C4. I don't have a sword. <laughs> So, Alice is up for this. Oh, it says, there's also, uh, yeah, Zeo's Fort is the castle beyond the quicksand near Mile, so you can't get to it. Alice is up for this. Grizz is glad to hear that she's also up for getting rid of Zeo. Oh, so Grizz didn't leave. Seed then asks to take Rika along, and it turns out she's Seed's child, an artificial life form based on a prototype from before the Great Collapse. So Rika... Even, so Rika is not very... She, even though the plant has been there for a thousand years, she's only a recent creation, so she's as old as she looks, about like 18. Because you know Japan, all heroes are like 18. No, nobody's in their 20s when they save the world. You gotta put the, you gotta put the world in the But she's not like a biological baby? She's, a, she's like a maid baby? Well, she's like a, like a good bio form, but she doesn't look all monstrous and shit. She looks like a freaking cat girl. You know, you know Japan and their cat girls. So Alice agrees. Sure. Rika's excited about seeing the outside world. Professor Holt decides to go to the academy to let them know what's happening, and everyone leaves the bio plant. Seed knows that he must stem the outbreak of monsters. So when everyone leaves, he shuts himself down. Outside, Rika's overjoyed with the new sensations of seeing the real world and sunlight and wind. But then suddenly, the mountain above Zima explodes. The bio plant is destroyed. So Seed, you know, kills Good himself. Stuff. Good job, man. And what we had the, and we did literally nothing but talk to him. Yeah. We were like, hey guy, and he's like, Oh man, I cannot handle your fucking shit. I'm done with this. And just kills himself. Peace. And we're like, job well done, team. <laughs> Here, take my t- take my kid. He just showed up. Take my kid and fuck off so I can die. And give her we a massive him into suicide. So then you finally get to the Hunter's Guild, which has got a massive store filled Woo. with amazing shit, as well as giving you the ability to take on quests. And doing these quests gets you money so that you can buy better armor and shit. Right. Yep. Then you find a crashed ship nearby. Stop being weird and answer me, would you? What? Would you take what you could find? Would you gear up? Well, yeah, I mean, you're taking Han's money. You might as well gear up. So anyway, you enter this... It, 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 hold on, hold on. Before you get any... Stop anywaying and then continuing. My anyways go backwards. 
and you ways. Uh, um, before you continue, the place where you were getting all this gear, the, was it a shop that Han's family owned, or was it a different shop? No, you're in the town of Aledo, which has the Hunter's Guild in it. Right, so there's no Han shop family shop <laughs> there. Right? No, there's only a pawn shop, not a Han shop. Right, so what you do now is you take all the goods that you bought at Han's dad's shop, you sell them, you get that money, then you use that money to buy shit right there at that same counter, and then you wear that shit, and if Han fucks around, I don't know, keep him on a leash or some shit. If you can buy, like, a whip that also is a collar, and just keep him on that and let him heal you from there, <laughs> that would be... You, get like you, know, a... that, you know that weird... Uh, <clears throat> Like, the like snake that dog collars? catcher thing, it's like the noose on the end of the stick. Yeah, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the, <laughs> the noose on the end of the stick, and you just, like, hook them around the throat with it and keep them tight. Keep them on one of them. Yeah, so you can keep them at a distance. Just in case it, like, tries Maybe. to turn around, you can just, like, just choke them out. Wait, are you looking at are you looking at the camera right now? Hold on, check this. So you got your, your, your pipe, right? That's, this is, like, your rod yeah. that you're holding, and then it's got, like, the noose on the end. Yeah. Right? And then, like, what you got... Is you put it on a, like, I'm saying that they should make this if they don't. If they do, send me the gift so I can see it. <laughs> um, what they should have is, like, it's open yeah. and loose. Wait, wait. Okay. Yes, the yeah. rope goes right? through and the pole. As soon as the it rope... gets... Yes, the rope goes listen, through the pole so you can pull listen, and tighten I'm it. I'm inventing. Oh, and then the rope continues down to your hand? Yeah. So you can, like, tighten it or like loosen it, it as you nah. wish through the pole. Nah, I don't want that. I want, I want this. I want this. Listen, so okay. it's loose, right? And then inside... There's a winch on one of these, like, one of these two sides of the cable, right? And the winch is already wound so that when you get it onto something, like, you hook it on to, like, you know, a dude's head or whatever, and it clicks forward once, then the winch engages and automatically rolls up. So it's like, zoop, right? And yeah. then it clicks in, and the guy's neck is right there. And then at the, uh, <clears throat> wait, let me hold it like that. And then at the tip right here, yeah. there's a little cattle prod. With like a couple volts in it, and then if he fucks around, you just jam the stick forward, and in the back of the neck, he gets a little. Bleh, bleh. <laughs> but you really, you, know what I mean? you really want to keep Han down. No, man, I just can't trust that fucker. <laughs> so anyway, if he has to like turn in battle to heal me, I want it to be difficult for him. I want him to be like, uh, 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 uh. Uh, here you go pal here you go buddy here you go and I'll be like yeah thank you fuck you come on give it to me faster come here come here come here thanks and then get back up and like <laughs> kill some more monsters Han Han stop fucking around I can't kill monsters when you're pulling the leash and he's just like getting shocked on the ground because every time he gets like moved he shocks himself again and I'm just like hey hey cut it out Han this is your fault you need to stop <laughs> So anyway, you find yeah, this ship. That's how this would happen. You find this ship, you head no, to... No, 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 hold on. So to be clear, to be clear, in my campaign that I'm playing right now with you, I've just taken all of the gear that I bought at Han's dad's place, It served you, it, yeah, it served you well until you got it. to Aledo. Right, and then I, I sold it to this guy at this shop that isn't Han's friends or family, <laughs> and then I used the money from this guy's shop to repurchase like decent gear Better that armor. wasn't the same gear and now yeah i'm having that on and han is at a distance if not with a collar <laughs> <laughs> if i can't get that then fine but if i can get that then better yes that's how it goes but that's what's happening i don't know if they so we find a shipyard right i don't know if they sell the han pole but anyways you uh, leave the town of later you find a crashed ship and as you make it through, you, uh, Rika finds a computer. Crashed where? Like a space, wait, 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 hold on. A spaceship or like a pirate ship? Spaceship. Okay, that makes more sense. Because I was like, why the fuck is there a pirate ship on land? <laughs> well, unless there was like ocean. I was a long time ago, Or thrown by a tornado. Well, that's what I was, that, or maybe you didn't mention that the town that they were at was like a seashore town. <laughs> or like a beach, whatever front, whatever. Anyway, continue, though. They found a, a fucking spaceship. They found a rocket. Yeah, so they find this ship. They begin feeling... I just lit a rocket. Rockets explode! Image appears! Rika says that they're on a ship that crashed here from Parma a thousand years ago. 
just before the satellite Gyra crashed into Parma in AW 1284, causing it to explode. The ship had escaped with some Parmanians. Unfortunately, the ship was caught in Motavia's orbit. While trapped in space, all of its passengers died. As the orbit decayed, the ship grew closer and closer to the planet until it finally crashed. Rika then finds out that there were in fact dozens of ships that escaped from Parma. Some of them landed on Motavia, some on a planet called Dezolus. What the fuck are you doing? God damn you. <laughs> he just like slowly pulls. What is that, a Twix? Mm. Oh, oh, Crunchy? Yeah, he yeah. slowly pulls a Nestle Crunchy bar into frame when I ask what the noise is, and he's just got this look on his face. Just like, eh? Oh, well, oh, well, also an O'Henry as well. Yep, we're snacking it live. No, that was breakfast. This is, this is lunch. Breakfast, lunch. Okay, so some Permanians landed on Motavia, others on a planet called Dezolus, and the others disappeared into space. Okay, hold on. Let me do a Boswell recap for you. So what I'm hearing is we, we left the shop, we found a rocket. We walked up to the rocket, the computer lady hacked that shit. Rika, right? Yep. Is that her name? Yep. Yep. So she hacked the ship and found out that that ship was from another planet that basically Krypton. And yeah. on its way out, it had like a family of people or whatever, like a little, little like maybe 60 people. And instead of accidentally crashing into the wrong planet, they accidentally got caught in the gravitational field of the wrong planet and then starved to death in the orbit. And then eventually the orbit just fucked off because they weren't lucky enough to lose that orbit quick enough. <clears throat> yeah. And then, and then it crashed and then we found it. Yeah. And there's just a bunch of skeletons in it. Yeah, so that explains why we why nobody had been like, hey, remember that rocket that's been outside of town for like a thousand years? So I guess it crashed like recently. But everyone was already long dead. They were okay. just basically, it was basically an orbiting space mausoleum. Right. Okay. Well, so that's kind of a bummer, but also, fuck these other planets. Apparently, in the solar system, planets are just having this issue of blowing up. So I think that us, like, blowing up is not the biggest thing in the world. I think what we should be focused on is more, like, what's causing shit to blow up. Maybe just putting a stop to that. Not worry so much about us blowing up. Okay, so you wander around, you commit, you do a few more guild jobs, and then when you're able to find this thing that will let you cross the desert, well, at least let you cross the quicksand. Feet? No, it lets, lets you cross well, the quicksand. Is it called a plank <laughs> of wood? Is it called a rope? <laughs> They have fucking spaceships. Like, what? Is it called rocket boots? I don't know. I'm just, like, trying to isolate, like, all this talk about, like, the rest of the game to find the cutscenes. Well, uh, okay, so... Can you describe this thing to me? What is it that they use? Also, is the same... Is, like, the quicksand, like... It's like a, it's like a Land Rover. The entire desert? Oh, uh, no, the quicksand is just, like, a large patch between a mountain range... So you can't get around it. So a plank, though. A plank would do it no, fine. It's like, a, it's like a massive quicksand field. It's not like a little so patch a, where you could like, like, jump over it. It's like a but like a steel beam that was long <laughs> enough? So anyway, you fight a monster... Uh, it's, not, like, it's not lava. No, but it's like You a, could literally put... It's like a massive expanse of quicksand. There's no like, there's no like ladder long enough. This isn't like Zelda where you can put down like okay, a tiny no, step like, ladder and just like mosey on over. Uh, okay, like <clears throat> actual sizes aside, there's a city close to this place, right? On the other side. And all side. the people just died in that city. <clears throat> uh, no, they're on the other side. I think they're called. The town is called Mile. And I think it's like Zio's town. 
Oh, okay, but like the city that they just left with all the dead people in it, and then they found the rocket ship. That's pretty close still, right? What are you doing? How much research does this take? I'm looking for the Land Rover. I, I'm less interested in that now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I fucked up. You don't find the Land Rover yet. Forgive me. Man, I've got a lot of editing to do on this. What is it? Okay, so... What? No. So what do they find? Well, after you find the Parmanian uh, ship... Yeah. I was just looking here. It says, detour to Fort. Go straight up. Go all the way. Uh, most... Okay, so from the town of... Uh, fuck. Old Valeria. No. Ale Aedo. It's the one with all the... Yeah, the hunters, the hunter guild Aedo. town of Aedo. Okay. Yeah. You end up taking... Aedo, all the chocolate bars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you end up finding... By going around the mountain range, you end up finding a town called Kaderi, or Kaderi. Now, most people in this village are either under the evil spell of Zeo or they're mortally afraid of him. There's even a church dedicated to him and a possessed man convulsing in front of it. You won't find much in value of terms of information here, but there is a weapon worth getting. Which you give to Alice, called the Laser Slasher. Rest at the inn if you like and then purchase any supplies you'll need, then leave Kadari. Wander around outside, returning when you need to until you get everyone up to level 14. When you've completed the Hunter's Guild job, you should be well on the way to achieving this. Fully restore your party before going south to Zeo's Fort. Yeah, so you've basically taken the very long way around to get to Zeo's Fort. Like, the, the Land Rover thing will be coming late. You know, fuck everything, delete everything I said. No. I don't know if I should delete everything I said about the Land Rover or leave it in, but you're not there yet. You took the long way around, you got to Zeo's Fort. So, but as soon as you... Okay, one, don't edit this. Hey, hey, one, don't edit this. Two, everything you just said got, like, computer matrix derped out, so it was like... <laughs> also, <clears throat> also, so I'm to understand that uh, they left a hundred gills town. Yeah. Then they were like, you know, let's, let's hang out outside near the town, and we'll just keep going back to it when we need to, like, level, or, like, when we need to buy stuff from leveling up. And rest. And by leveling up, we're going to go... Well, yeah, and rest. And and in order like to farm and level up, we're just going to take the long way around this mountain or whatever to get to the next city that we need to go to. This is already the... We don't have to cross the quicksand. You're already on the long way around. This isn't like an active By choice. By resting and going back? No, but just no, just getting yourself leveled up to, to take on Zeo's fort. So anyway... Soon yeah, as... by farming. That's what I said. Yeah, I literally so... said, let's farm and take the long way around. So when you enter, you find a yellow force... Oh, yeah, Zeo's Fort, technically... Hold the fuck on. <laughs> Zeo's Fort, technically, is separated by quicksand. From from the nearest. From you, but well, you guys just go... No, not from where you are presently. I fucked up, because I haven't played this game in a couple of months. It is directly close to another right. town, but there is a massive field of quick... A massive valley of quicksand in between that... That's what I remembered out of out of uh, what I was supposed to, improperly. So anyway, you go into Zeo's Fort. Okay. You make your way in, and there's a yellow force field. You know, you can examine this invisible barrier if you wish, but there's no way to get past it. So you walk to the left or right around the structure. There's two staircases. You end up going through a bunch of shit, and then you find... A wizard named Juza, or Yuza, or Juzza. Jizzer. He, he's the brother of the Reza. He's the Jizza. So anyway, you fight him, and... He's probably an ODB. After you defeat Juza, a staircase will appear. You go down, around, and you remove... And then, uh, as a spoiler, it says, remove all of Alice and Han's equipment, 
you'll find out why very soon. And when you do... Dude, fuck that. Just take it out of the wrapper. What? So, you find an... Mm, you find an unusual object. Rika identifies this object as Demi, the android you've been looking for. Alice cuts her free of her bonds and then introduces herself. Demi is grateful and uses her medical power to heal the party before telling them she's responsible for controlling Nervous. Like, she's like the, uh, she's the interface with the global system. While Grizz and Han are awed by her human likeness, Alice asks if Demi can stop Nervous from supplying energy to the system. She explained that she already tried when she's interrupted by an unseen voice. Zeo has made Zeo finally appears in his menacing way and accuses the group of breaking into his property. Chaz suggests that Zeo looks at his own actions before judging others, but Zeo doesn't see anything wrong with what he's done. He taunts Grizz a little before Alice points out that if Zeo continues to do as he's done, all of Motavia will be destroyed. Zeo is pleased with this outcome, pointing out that his god wants no life on Algo. And then he sees Red. He makes a short speech vowing to destroy them all in the name of his god, Dark Force, and begins battle. But however, it's a battle you cannot win. Before you get a chance to do anything, Zeo will cast Magic Barrier, reducing all magic damage you do to one, and you won't even hit him with regular attacks. The only way to get through this battle is to just let it happen. In, the, in a few rounds, he will summon Nightmare and Black Wave, the battle ends with a cutscene. Alice jumps in the way to protect Chaz from the Black Wave. Han and Rika suggest they retreat. Chaz uses an es Chap uses warp to escape. By the way, the naming convention here says like Hina to escape, which is fucking bullshit. And then they have like Foy for fire, and then like okay, the the the, the spell naming convention in this game is fucking ass. Like nothing here. Gives any hint or indication as to what it does. You're like, what the hell is Renus? What's Gyrez? What's Ryuka? Like, you only find out, oh, it's warp. It's heal. It's exit. I mean, like, Final Fantasy. Say what you want about Final Fantasy, but at least they know how to name their spells. So you have some idea. So you got, like, a pretty darn good idea what they do. Fantasy Star? Fuck you. So the group warps itself to Krupp. And Alice has been Alice is taken to a bed at the inn. Her condition gets worse. Chaz notes that Zeo's unlike anything he's ever fought, and Rika diagnoses that Alice has been affected by an evil force. Demi explains that Zeo built his fort on top of Nervous, and Chaz realizes that Nervous must be the barrier they couldn't cross before. Alice then mentions to Rune that that Rune might be able to help, pointing out there's no way they can get past the magical barrier with what they have now. Rika asks who Rune is, and Chaz replies with his opinion, reluctantly agreeing that they may need his help. As Rune went off with Grandfather Doran, Grizz decides that they must have gone to a place called Ladia Tower, located on a small island across the quicksand of the east. While Han and Grizz try to Holy work shit. out how they will cross, Demi suggests they can use the Land Rover, an all-purpose armor-plated car. Apparently, they, there should be one located at the Machine Center to the south. They decide to leave, although Chaz asks Han to stay behind and look after Alice. Han isn't too happy about the idea at first, but agrees in the end. You're then free to go. And because Alice isn't in the party, you don't get to extort Han. Wow. So Alice leaves the party. <laughs> Brandon's doing a little yay dance. Brandon's doing a little happy dance. Alice has left the party. Han has left the party. Demi joins the party. So Demi is an android. Is the computer. She's an nervous. android. She's like a, a cute little green cat girl android thing. Yeah, the same way that Rika was a computer at whatever the last one was called. Well, she's biological. She's like a bioform. Demi is an android. Right. So... As you make your way to the machine center in the south, Demi approaches the panel, uses the control key to access the computer. As she stands at the terminal, she notices many machines housed in the center, most of them are old and will need repairs. Chaz is impressed and asks Demi if Zeo caught her while she was trying to get the system back under control. She concurs, but then goes on to state that getting rid of Zeo won't solve the problem. It seems that Zelen, 
The main control system from Otavia's environment is the source of the malfunctions on the planet, but the fact that Zalon is an orbiting satellite makes this, a makes this fact a little useless at the present. So Nervous is like the onboard implementation of this yeah. terraforming system, but Zalon is the satellite that gives it its remote commands. So a huge vehicle... So after after right. she messes with sense. the computer a bit, a huge vehicle rolls into view. A little while after, the machine, the party's outside the machine center, and they're in their very own Land Rover. And the Land Rover lets you traverse the quicksand. Yay! Woo! You can Land traverse Rover the time. quicksand, and you can get into the random battles with it. But you don't gain like Yeehaw. it doesn't gain experience. But you can still blast monsters with it. What? Oh, you can use it, but it doesn't get stronger. Can you upgrade yeah. it later in the game? No. Does it come back? You get different vehicles. What do you mean, no? And the best part is, like, this but, is always like, a, a, it's always it an item. Back? No, it's an item you can take anywhere. Mm. Which you can I guess, have like, it all the time? Yeah, it's like Dragon Ball, where you guess, I guess you, like, shrink it to a little capsule and put it in your pocket. Otherwise, oh, you're yeah, it's just like Dragon Ball. On your back. <laughs> Everybody gets that. How about, it's just like Ant-Man in the time in that recent fucking Marvel movie when Ant-Man's dad or whatever had a tiny tank on his keychain. <laughs> How about that, you fucking fool? It's just like Dragon Ball, you know. How everybody knows Dragon Ball. <laughs> anyway. Check yourself. So anyway. So you get into the... You use the tank to uh, drive across... Wait, wait. Across. Were you looking at the camera? Uh, I see you smoking. Were you, you looking smoking. at the camera when I said that? No. But, like, I was like, check yourself. And I lit the dart at the same time. And it was like huh. super hardcore looking. Yeah, like You're Samuel L. Jackson. God damn you. Pay attention to me. I'm reading the fucking walkthrough. This is story time with Uncle Mike. Yeah, I, have well, to look at the, I have to look at the book. Pay attention to me, Uncle Mike. <laughs> look at me. You're, you're not doing a high dive off the board. I can't be looking at you all the time. So anyway, you uh, that speak to the your probation officer. So anyway, you find a large crack in the ground. So ah! a fence to this. There's a sign blocking entry to the crack. It reads, danger, no trespassing, cracks in the ground. Speak to the man on the right, and he will tell you Monson has been suffering from earthquakes recently. And on cue, the ground begins to shake violently. Grizz gets into a panic, and Rika teases him for being afraid. Demi supposes that the plate system to the north must be the cause of the problem, and Grizz proposes they shut nope. it down. Yes, there's nope. a system that actually nope. controls tectonic plates. Yeah, but nope, nope. It's a setup. <laughs> it's a setup by the dude that mentioned it. That guy that's like, uh, earthquakes uh, happen all the time here. Uh, so, so you think, you, you, so, you, think he's, you. you think he's working with Han? It's a con. It's a con from Han. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long Han. He's pulling the long Han, yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> I don't trust this fucker. He's going to send us over there, and we're going to find some shit. We're going to probably shut it off. We're going to get another dickhead in our fucking party, and then that dickhead's going to be not trusty. Don't trust that next dickhead. Well, anyway, you go into the tectonic plate system, and you end up... Of course. To the, the north. The good thing is, is that there's no boss. But Demi acts... Okay. You get some... Uh, you get a neat addition for Demi, which is something called a phonomezer, which is basically like an upgraded laser attack sound wave thing. I'm not quite sure. Anyway, it's an attack that right. she gains, which is an upgrade, which is always good when you got right. an android. So Demi accesses yep. the panel, shuts down the controls for the plate system. This makes Grizz happy, but Demi points out it hasn't solved the problems. They still need to shut down Nervous and maybe even Zelen. After a good night's sleep, you leave Monson and get in your Land Rover. You head northeast towards the plate system, and then continue past it until you, meet your, until you reach our mountain range into the village of Termi. It's a village steeped in legend, and is the hometown of Alice, a legendary heroine from 2,000 years ago. Not to be confused with Alice, the, most the woman legendary in your group. heroine. <laughs> yep, exactly. She likes the legendary heroine. She is not the legendary heroine. No, but then you, you hey, go heroine. past this town to a town, to a place called Ladia Tower, and in there yeah. <laughs> you're in a huge chamber whose sole feature is a staircase. And as you climb this up to the top, you will see Rune. 
You talk to him and he teases Chaz, but Chaz doesn't have time for games. He asks for Rune's help and yeah. Rune notices that Alice is missing. Chaz explains what happened and Rune reassures him everything will be fine when they get the Psycho Wand. He goes on to say the Psycho Wand is the only thing that can break through the magical barrier and he's come to the tower to get it. So Rune decides to join the party. Unfortunately, one of Zeo's servants has been waiting for the Psycho Wand to be released. The party are not going to let the monster take the wand, though, and the battle begins when you fight a monster called Gilagua. Right. And then, yep, so then Demi uses her phone on, which is that awesome upgrade you got, and then you eventually wear this guy down and beat him. You get the Psycho Wand. Grizz is now confident nothing can stop them now. Rune and Rika have a strange feeling. Rune tells Chaz that they must go to Krupp immediately. A split second later, you've been warped there. The party enters Alice's room at the inn, and Han informs Chaz that Alice's condition has gotten much worse. A cutscene begins. Alice isn't looking good. Chaz implores Rune to help her, but he cannot. The black energy wave contains an evil power created by something more than just Zeo, so it is beyond Han's power to cure. Alice tries to speak, asking Rune to take care of Chaz and then tells Chaz to come closer that she may have one last look at him. Alice tells him that from now on he must carve out his own destiny, and with her dying breath she thanks him. Rika begins to cry. A short while later, a funeral is held for Alice, attended by her friends. And I bet what they didn't mention, and I bet what they didn't mention is that Han is quietly smiling behind them all. Because now nobody, nobody's going to be... No. But I'm pretty sure he's happy that no one's going to be hustling him anymore. That e- that evening, I, Chaz okay, is looking... You've played this game. Hey, yeah. hold on. You've played this game. Don't spoil this, but my prediction is that the next time Han tags along, fucking Chaz is going to be like, yeah, that also, that's going to be like 1300 bucks. <laughs> he's got to keep he's got to keep Alice's memory alive. Yeah, I swear to God, that's my prediction. <laughs> Chaz is going to be the er, uh, and and Han's going to be like, "Uh, what the fuck?" <laughs> my prediction anyway continue so, on that evening Chaz is Funeral. looking up at the stars alone Rune comes out to talk to him Chaz explains that before he met Alice he was living in a far off country where he did some pretty bad things when he became a hunter he was finally able to earn money and live a good life with Alice gone Chaz doesn't know what to do he wants to avenge her death but he wouldn't understand why he was fighting anymore Rune chastises Chaz I guess he Chaz tied him yep asking if Chaz really joke. thinks that asking if Chaz really thinks that F. Alice was only fighting for money. He tells Chaz to think about it, then Rune returns indoors. Rika comes outside to see Chaz and tells him how glad she's been since leaving the bio plant. She's learned a lot from C, but there's a big difference between knowing and experiencing. Chaz understands and puts his arm around Rika as they both look up at the stars. The next day, Han tells the others he's going to return to the academy and convince them to come up with a plan of action. Chaz agrees and wishes him luck, and Han leaves. Probably because he knows that Chaz is about to fuck him for some money. The rest of the party decide to get going. Now that you can control the party again, your next destination is nervous. Since you haven't had the chance yet, equip your new Psycho Wand. Sweet. What's it do? It dispels the barrier. So now you can finally get inside nervous and shut down that computer and take care of this fucking planet. So you get inside, you start. Dope. Yeah, yeah, you start in the green antechamber. You head through the door, notice the usual high tech decor. Examine the panel at the junction. Rika suggests Demi sends an interrupt command, but Demi points out the system isn't accepting commands anymore. You have to get to its nucleus. Right. And when you finally do get to the main terminal, just before you turn it on, just before you get to access it, Zeo appears. He's impressed by your arrival, but he informs you you'll be going no further. And as usual, he begins a battle and sets up his magic barrier. However, you use the psycho psycho wand, and now he's vulnerable to attacks. Prick ass.
Oh yeah, so you finally beat him, and a cutscene follows that begins with the death of Zeo. He's confused by this, as he was under the impression he was immortal, but it seems that Dark Force has abandoned him. Grizz is delighted, and Chaz thinks about Alice. Demi informs the party that they won't be able to shut down Nervous by normal means, and that she must connect to it directly to access it. She bids farewell to the group and then accesses Nervous. A few seconds later, the operation is successful. All of the control systems on Motavia have been stopped. She points out, however, that without the systems operational, Motavia will soon become an uninhabitable barren rock again. So they must be reset. But this time, you know, like, well, basically, like in 1995, they found the original problem that all computers have. <laughs> have you tried turning it off and on again? Yep. Rika then points out that something must be done about Zelen, the satellite that's sending the abnormal signals. She suggests they go up to Zelen, and Chaz concurs. Grizz then notes that Zelen's in outer space, which is a little difficult to reach. This doesn't pose a problem, as Demi informs them that Nervous is equipped with a shuttle. She then tells the group she cannot go with them, because she has to constantly, I guess, keep this thing off. But she tells them to seek her master, Ren, who was aboard the satellite. And no, he's not a span. And no, he's not a Spanish Chihuahua. This is Ren with a W. <laughs> the next thing you see is a spaceport rising from the sand a little to the northwest of Zio's fort. A bright, shiny shuttle glints in the sun, and the party marvel at it for a while. But one of them won't be going. Grizz can't leave his little sister. You know, I think he's scared of earthquakes, and he's also scared of space. For, you know, for the big, dumb, strong guy in the group, he's kind of a puss. No, he's gonna have a couple weaknesses. So Grizz. Yeah, Grizz leaves the party. So now the party's only Chaz, Rika, and Rune. Right. And then you get into the spaceship, and then it takes off. A single destination is shown, Zelen. You make it to the satellite, and you meet Ren. Ren introduces himself to the party. He goes on to explain that Zelen controls the environmental systems for all the planets in Algo, and that he manages the system. He then asks Rika who the rest of the party are. She introduces Chaz and Rune, telling him they are great friends, but Chaz disagrees with that. Rika goes on to say Demi informed them that the problem with Motavia's system was supposed to be caused by Zelen. Ren then explains that Zelen is not behind the systems running out of control, but that Zelen has no control at all. It seems that Curran, the support satellite to Zelen, has somehow usurped Zelen's control and is the one sending the abnormal commands. The fact that Zelen was at the top of the command chain led Demi to believe that this was the cause, as Zelen's communications have been down for the last six months. Chaz then suggests they go to Curran, and Ren asks if he may accompany the party as there's nothing he can do from Zelen. Rika vouches for him, telling Chaz that Ren and Seed were her teachers. After a little argument between Chaz and Rune, the party decide to leave. And Ren, being a big honkin' android, is the big tank of your group. Sweet. So, you head to... Sweet. Yeah, so you head to Karan. And Chaz notices something is wrong. An alarm sounds. Ren reports that there's an unidentified energy reaction coming from the engine room. So the party decide to investigate. A short while later, they discover an uninvited guest is mucking around with the controls. It didn't expect to be discovered, but decides it doesn't matter when it sabotages the engines. It doesn't matter whether it sabotages the engines or kills the party immediately, as long as they don't get to Curran. The Chaos Sorcerer then initiates a battle. The saboteur is dead, but it seems he did his work well. The ship is in tr Oh, wait, 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 you're not on... Wait, are you on Curran or...? I don't know. Yeah, this is all happening. This is all happening on the shuttle on your way to Curran. Okay. So you don't make it to Curran. Your your flight path has been fucked up. He suggests Ren suggests that you make a crash landing on Dazolus, and ask the party for their opinion. Chaz replies rather alarmingly, "There's not really a choice in the matter, so there's no point in the question." Ren makes preparations to crash. Rika seems to be enjoying herself, and Chaz gets panicky, asking if she's thinking straight. Ren and Rune tell Chaz to calm down, but Chaz can't understand how everyone can be so relaxed about things. The ship begins to descend. Well, Rika's happy, because this is her first crash. She's just like, oh my god, I could die. But I won't be dying in that friggin'... I won't be dying in that friggin' terminal cave. Yay! 
So you crash land on the planet of Dezolas, where you get to see the shuttle crashing into the snowy surface. The door opens and the party steps out and Chaz comments on their flamboyant landing. A green-faced old man approaches and jokes that it's raining machines. He appears to be a Dezolian and asks who they are, pointing out that they've destroyed his temple. Chaz apologizes Fuck and the Dezolian... <laughs> The Dezolian notices his unusual-looking companions, Rika and Ren. He figures they can't be from Motavia and makes a joke about how they came to arrive. Rika seems to find him quite amusing. Chaz doesn't share her humor. Ren then approaches and informs yeah, him I'm on the Chaz's shuttle is... page. The shuttle is beyond repair. Rika asks the old man who tells her his name is Raja if there's anything they can do to fix the ship. He tells her there isn't, but goes on to say that there's another ship on the planet. No, this old man is inconveniently informed. Chaz asks where, but Raja agrees only if they he only if they allow him to accompany them. Chaz doesn't seem keen on the no. idea, but Rika thinks that he's interesting. No. Rune makes the valid point that no. they have no choice, so they're going to accept his proposal. Fuck you, Rune. <laughs> Raja then explains the Parmanians landed on Dezolus many years ago and that their ship is still in Tyler, the town of their descendants. A short distance to the northwest. They then decide to leave. Raja joins and he's a physically weak character like Rune, but a very powerful wizard. So you walk out of Raja's temple, you'll find yourself in the middle of a massive snowstorm. A short conversation will then follow that begins with Chaz commenting on the weather. Raja tells him that the storm's been going on for three months, and even though Dezolos always has a cold climate, it's never been this bad in all his life. Ren suggests that it must be the Dizolian Climate Control Center, but Raja thinks otherwise. He talks about a place called the Garuburk Tower, which he thinks is responsible for the snowstorm. He cracks another joke that only Rika finds funny, and then you're given control again. Your next destination is Rion, so save and get into your Land Rover, or stay on foot and head north. So you so, enter the... T hold on. So this prick, what's this prick's name that we just picked up? Raja. So, Raja, he's like, hey, can I come with you guys? I know you're doing a specific thing, but I, that would be cool with me. And also, you fucked up my temple, so I'm coming with you guys. And then we're like, okay, cool. We're doing this thing where we go to uh, these climate control places, and we check to see if they're fucked, and pretty much they always are. So then we fix them, and uh, that's what we're doing. And he's like, he's like, you know what? Fuck you guys. Let's go to a tower instead. Because I'm definitely <laughs> sure that's the problem, and I'm the new guy, so listen to me. It's my it's my planet, I don't, so I don't fuck like you. This guy. <laughs> I also well, did just realize that we're on a different planet. I forgot about that. Yep. So you go through the town of Riona. You'll notice the same music played here when you fit, when you met Grandfather Doran, as you're about to meet his Dizolian counterpart, whose name is Gayuna. Go to the bar and speak to Gayuna. He will see that you're friends of Raja, and will answer some questions for you. Reply no to knowledge about the snowstorm, the Garberg Tower, and Raja, but reply yes to finding the whereabouts of the spaceship. He will tell you the spaceship is found underground in Tyler, and examining the grave will open up the path. So then you make your way to Tyler. Oh, okay. After you do, you, you go north of the entrance of Tyler, head west, and you ascend a short flight of stairs. In this hill is a headstone. Examine it, and it says, Here lies the great leader Tyler. Touch us, listen to our voice, and trust that body to us. Which is a really weird epitaph. It's Tyler's grave, That's so Chaz inspects... <laughs> it is. Touch the... Chaz inspects the stone as Gayona suggested. While examining the inscription again, the plate moves. Chaz pushes it, and the gravestone splits apart, revealing a staircase below. And underwards, uh -huh. you find a spaceport. Fishy. Which... Yep, you find a spaceship. Chaz is impressed. Rune takes a closer look and realizes it's called the Landale. Raja tries to make a funny remark, but Chaz ignores him and asks Ren about its condition. Ren replies that it's, it's been preserved almost perfectly and that it will only take a little maintenance to be up and running. Chaz tells Ren to prepare for takeoff, and the next thing you see is a spaceport identical from Otavia rise from the ground southwest of Tyler. You take the party to the spaceport, and then you check the party's status. You ideally want everyone to be up to level 22, and so you do. And then you head to Curran. You finally get to Curran, the satellite that's been fucking everything up. After the short dialogue, you head up the passageway, take the elevator to the floor above, 
follow the platform, blah, blah, blah. Chaz asks what's in there, and Ren replies that it's an internal weapon for androids. So you find a weapon for him called a hyperjammer, which temporarily scrambles the AI of machines using electromagnetic waves. Since you're on a satellite... Okay. <laughs> you look so depressed. I'm just, like, just trying to take this all in and, like, honestly not fall asleep. I'm struggling because, Jesus Christ. Yeah. So they, get, they get there and they get their satellite. Yep, also, I'm getting and... a kink in my neck from constantly looking this way. Yep. Let's try this. Instead. So you go through the satellite and you find, the, you find uh -huh. a strange object covering the computer terminal. The party stops and Rika feels a great sense of oppression. Rune recognizes this energy as dark force, the same being that Zeo has revered as a god. Ren, in his unemotional way, diagnoses dark force as the cause of the problem and they must remove it. Rune remarks that it may be easier said than done, but Chaz has no fear. He tells the party to go for it and a battle begins, and you take on dark force, which is without a doubt the most powerful enemy you have faced thus far. But, after wearing it down... Yeah, from what I perused... What I perused from memes and shit, it seems like Dark Force is the continual bad guy in all the stuff. Yeah, right? in all these. Throughout uh, the series. Yep. So he explodes so in a display of we're light. We're just gonna fight him. Yep. Great. Chaz tells Ren to get Curran back to normal, and Ren efficiently obliges. Chaz then asks Rune how he knew the creature was Dark Force, and Rune replies that he's seen it before. Chaz then asks where he saw it, but Rune isn't in the mood for answering. Chaz and Rika get a little suspicious, but this is interrupted by Ren approaching and informing them that all of Curran's functions have been properly restored. He also tells them that they need to go, but what they need to do now is make some final adjustments at Zelen. So, they go. A little while later, Ren has done his stuff and tells the party all the maintenance systems for Algo's environment are again working properly. Everything seems to be sorted Whoa. out, but it appears that Dezolus' snowstorms haven't stopped. Chaz asks if their systems have been restored. Ren confirms that they have. Raja then says he told them so and that the demons in the Garibur Tower are causing the blizzard on Dezolus. He moans that they never listen and Ren points out that if the snowstorms don't stop, the Parmanians and the Dezolians will perish. He then decides to go back to Dezolus but Rune points out that it's covered with walls of ice and it won't be accessible on the surface. Ren suggests they can use the Ice Digger, a car that he had purposely built in preparations for any actions required on Dezolus. He then loads it into the Landale. The Ice Digger is now in your inventory. Sweet. Nice. I love an Ice Digger. So now I can just bust that shit out whenever I need it. Yep, and then you come across a village of penguins. There's absolutely nothing to do here. You can feed penguins for like some shitty cutscene. But there's no worth to it at all. And then okay. you... Okay, I've obviously seen all this text. I must have skipped a uh, cutscene somewhere. Fuck it. Okay, so... Uh, it's probably a cutscene with some bunnies and shit. Yeah, well, you had, for, for some reason, you still end up heading to the weather system, even though Ren... Raja keeps telling you it's the Garibur Tower. So you go there and right. you find that there's this monster called Gailagua. The same one as before. After you destroy him, Ren will announce that they are in the control system for the Dezolus climate and Chaz notes the monsters there have been making a nest. As they suspected the center must be the cause of the normal weather conditions, Raja still says it's the damn Garibur Tower. Okay, so, so are you, you fight go to that fucking tower or not? Well, first you got to get rid of the monsters that are in the climate control system, and after you defeat you defeat a guy called D Elm Lars, Chaz will be uneasy about the fact that Dark Force may still be alive, because this guy still had that same poisonous energy around him. And however, Ren informs the party that there's nothing wrong with the climate control system. Again, Raja says the Garber Tower is behind it all. And then you come across a town called Reshel, and then you remove all of Raj's equipment because you find that there's a lot of sick people in this place. And then Raja starts getting dizzy and collapses to the floor. 
Chas thinks this is another one of his jokes, but Rico points out he's got a tremendous fever. They carry into a bed, and dude, you gotta like stop relaxing because if you pass out on me, you won't be able to like export your file. Yeah, you know what? I'm getting bored of this. Like, this was a great you punishment, but now it's starting to be a punishment for me. You so, stop relaxing. You end up finding... Uh... Yeah, so I'm going to stop reading this from now on, now that you've got these characters. <laughs> they end up heading towards the Airbrook <laughs> Tower. However, there's a whole bunch of... So they got their galactic passport. ...won't get chopped up by the digger. And there's this lady trying to chop up the roots herself, but they keep growing around her, and now she's getting stuck. So you end up fighting, chopping through the roots, you get her out, and you end up finding that she's part of a group called uh, the Esper Mansion, which is like a monastery. Yeah. And she's yeah. A, a holy warrior who keeps waiting for the return of someone called Lutz, who is supposed to be... Okay. Yeah, Lutz is like the leader. L-U-T-Z. Someone called yeah. Lot. And as you pass through, you find yourself L -O -T -S. in the courtyard. Rune will explain that they are in the sanctuary oh, and that there's a chamber called Lutz's oh. room. So, uh, yeah, basically, Kira, yeah. the lady that you rescued, wants to speak with Lutz, the leader of this group, to get advice on how to destroy the tree roots. There's a chamber called Lutz's room. Kira confirms this. The party heads down the stairs and they approach a small sphere, which is in the center of an otherwise empty room. Kira looks around, wondering where could Lutz be, and then Rune explains that Lutz will not be here, because he died a long time ago. Ren adds to the thing that no human could live for 2,000 years. Well, because people keep seeing him. People keep seeing him, so that kind of keeps it up. Why, so why are Ren, they just figuring and, this shit out now? And they've been now. seeing Lutz, who's been protecting Dezolos for 2,000 years. Dickheads. But Kira doesn't accept that because she saw sure. Lutz with her own eyes years ago. She also says she believes in the legends of the Espers and of Lutz, and why everyone is trying so hard. Rune tells Kira to calm down, telling her that even if Lutz's body is no more, his spirit lives on. He adds that before Lutz died, he left his will and memory in the ball that's on the table, called the telepathy ball. Rika asks Rune if she's just saying the ball is Lutz, but Rune tells her that the ball is empty, because Lutz is not there right now. He then says if the chosen person appears, Lutz's memory and will are transferred to that person. And Rune points at his own head, and the party realizes that Rune is Lutz. The old man appears... Yeah, this old Lutz, caretaker Lutz. appears and confirms this. He explains that Rune Walsh is the fifth generation Lutz, and Kira's left bewildered. And he tells him since ancient times there's been a cycle where disasters occur every thousand years due to a personification of evil called Dark Force that occurs every thousand years. He adds that up until now, a courageous person would defeat the evil and bring peace to the world. Then they would put their memories in this ball so that when the next thousand years comes along, someone will take this and they'll know how to defeat Dark Force. Rico points out they definitely did destroy Dark Force on Curran, but abnormal conditions are still continuing. Rune goes on to explain that Algo was shaken a thousand years ago by the explosion of the planet Parma, upsetting the balance they've tried so hard to maintain. That he surmises this may be the cause. Chaz asks Rune if that means Dark Force is still alive. Rune replies he doesn't know, but he is certain the root of all evil is not destroyed, and it must be. Rune then tells Chaz that he has chosen him as the soldier to fight the final battle, explaining he sensed from the start Chaz had great potential. In a more lighthearted manner, Rune apologizes for keeping it a secret from Chaz and jokingly asks if they'll keep cooperating with him. Chaz, a little confused, sort of agrees, and then Rune announces they go to the Garibert Tower. The old man says that there's a forest of carnivorous trees surrounding the tower, which you already know, but if you use the Eclipse Torch, they'll be able to destroy the roots. And then... Rune Neat. tells Chaz to stop looking so dazed, and Kira expresses her disappointment that Lutz would be such an insensitive lout. Rune apologizes, telling her he's always been like that, but it doesn't seem to make Kira any happier. So then you look for a torch, nah. and uh, blah blah blah. You find this temple, and but, but just when you're about to grab the torch... Uh...
Yeah, three purple robed witches appear around the eclipse torch. The middle one laughs, telling them that he intends to take the torch. Chaz asks the witch what they think they're doing, and the witches tell them that they are from the air castle. The one in the middle then addresses Rune personally, saying that if he's Lutz, he'll remember them. The left one then adds that Rune will know where to be wait where the air castle is. They then steal the eclipse torch. And then the Dazolian is stricken. Okay, blaming, great. Yeah, and the caretakers for the torch are stricken, blaming themselves for their narrow mindedness because they didn't let Chaz take the torch right away, leaving these assholes time to come and take it. Chaz then tries to cheer him up. Chaz says all they have to do is go and retrieve yeah. it. The priest is grateful, but they, but Chaz adds if they do recover it, they must be allowed to borrow it. And then uh, Rune suggests that perhaps somehow the air castle managed to survive because the air castle was on Parma, a.k.a. the planet that exploded a thousand years ago. Ren is skeptical, but uh -huh. he says he will check out the census on the land. So it flew over? Hmm? Ren and me are on the same damn page. <laughs> Ren and me are like, right, so they had a sky castle on a different planet, and it flew here? What's the what's the deal? Well, it turns out that uh, Chaz asks Rune who the person was that the witches were talking about, and he explains that the first Lutz and his companions fought a man in the air castle, and that his name was Lashek. Chaz asks if that's the person they meant, but Rune replies Lashek was destroyed by Lutz and doesn't know what they will find until they get there. So you fly off into outer space and you find all that's left of Parma is, in fact, the castle. And I'm just going to try to skip ahead. You yeah. fight a boss called... You fight the uh, the witches. And... Uh, it begins, you fight the witches who are called Zathul. And then you go through the castle catacombs. Uh -huh. Of you course. fight Lashik, and uh, you end up burning the roots. You fight the Garibark Tower. You settle what's going on in there. And then you find yourself... Hmm? What the fuck did I... So what's actually, what, what's actually going on in the tower? Okay, so... You find the tower inside is organic like the tower is living it's like big fleshy biomass is all over the place you end up going through collecting treasures Yum. and shit and surprisingly enough what do you find in the control room of this organic tower but dark force the fuckers back so this version oh, of dark force is more powerful than the one you met on the satellite however so are you so yeah. Following Dark Force's second annihilation, the Garibark Tower shatters before your very eyes. Rune tells Chaz that they've done it. Reek announces the storm is over. The sky's clear and Rune notes that the black energy wave has stopped. He also guesses that the patients in the town of Mies, who have been suffering a plague, will also will be recovering. Kira sighs that it's over and thanks the party for all their help, realizing it was presumptuous of her to think she could do it alone. She decides to return to Mies to help with the work that still has to be done to restore everything that's been lost. And she says farewell to Chaz, embarrassing him by saying that he's like a baby brother to her. She then says goodbye to Lutz, commenting that she wasn't what, he ex what she expected, but he lived up to his name. Kira then leaves. Chaz is still dwelling on being called baby brother and wonders if he's still so undependable. Rune assures him that he has improved, but that Chaz is still a lot like him. The two of them joke around a little when suddenly there's an explosion beyond the mountains. Rika realizes this is Gumbia's temple, the temple where, uh, I guess she's, where she's from. And dude, open your eyes and look at me. Dude, do not pass out on me. We're almost done. I'm not. <laughs> Although I was yeah, having I'm a look... flashback about being at work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, Brandon is looking crestfallen and sad. Of course, that pretty yep. much, like, nobody really looks happy when they're passing out. No. Nope. So anyway, you return to Motavia. Yeah, there was just Woo. an explosion. Oh, wait. Yeah, we forgot the explosion. Rika realizes that Gumbia's temple's been exploded. Chaz is confused, noticing, noting that they beat Dark Force, so they need to find out what's going on. Yep. 
Walk north through the door, so you'll find a secret underground worship site. Uh, approach the old Dizolian sitting on the raised temple. He will speak to you. Introduce you. He will introduce himself as the village, as the bishop of Gumbius Temple, which has stood for two thousand years. Rune asks what's going on, and Rico will add the temple disappeared without a trace. Chas tells the bishop that they defeated Dark Force and asks if that isn't enough. The bishop replies that the profound darkness still exists, adding it is the root of all evil, and apparently Dark Force is just a tool in this existence. I feel like you already said this part. No, Profound Darkness is the new thing. Nope, first time I've mentioned the Profound Darkness. Dark Force is just an extension of this thing. The bishop continues that Dark Force came to Dezolus to find the location of Rykros. Chaz asks, what's that? The bishop tells him it's something beyond the party's control and it's the reason why the darkness stirs. He explains that if the Profound Darkness cannot get a hold of Rykros, it will not allow the party to get it. Rune asks what Rykros is, and Chaz adds that he can't understand how something could be so important that they must scramble to find it. The bishop replies that Rykros is the place where all the answers lie, but the party doesn't understand. He confesses that he doesn't know what or where Rykros is, but he does know when it returns, the prism will light the way. The arrow prism. Chaz has heard of the, Rune has heard of this artifact and tells the party that the first generation Lutz stored arrow prism in a place called the Soldier's Temple on Motavia. Then the party automatically flies to Motavia. The, uh, the Demi, calling from Nervous, welcomes Ren. He asks about the condition of Motavia, and she reports that it's still on hold. She adds that everything Ren requested is on standby. And now you have this thing called the Hydrofoil, which lets you cross water. It's much faster than the Land Rover and the Ice Digger, but it's not a very powerful combat vehicle. But it does, it's, not about, it's not about the power anymore, it's about getting to the fucking story. Yep. So I'm you find this soldier's through. temple. Yep, I'm pushing yep. through. We're getting into the soldier's temple on Motavia. I meant more. You find this guy. I meant more. I meant more in the story aspect, like them pushing through it. Yeah, that too. So, as you find the temple, a man will be standing outside the entrance to the cave and asks if the party are there to inspect the runes. Chaz will reply that they are, and that and asks the man who he is. He introduces himself as a traveling archaeologist named Seth. He tells the party that he's looking for the ruins of an ancient temple, but the monsters inhabit the cave that leads to it. This guy sounds like Han again. Yep. Chaz tells Seth that the like temple Han is exactly is where disguise. they're going. He's Han in, in a disguise. <laughs> that monsters inhabit the cave. Chaz tells Seth that the temple is exactly where they're going, and Seth thinks this is very fortunate. He asks if he can accompany the party, pointing out that he has confidence in his skills. Chaz wonders how an archaeologist can be of any help, but Ren adds their strength in numbers. Chaz accepts. Seth is grateful. He con- Rika comments to Rune how nice and polite Seth is, but Rune's mind is elsewhere. And Seth here has a whole bunch of neat skills, which is a little too much for an archaeologist. But you end up finding this thing called the Arrow Prism. You leave the temple. Chaz announces his discovery and asks how it will show the way to Rykos. Chaz sarcastically asks, comments, that he's a big help. You will leave, you know, walk up the steps, blah, blah, blah. And as you leave, a cutscene happens. The arrow prism becomes intensely radiant. Chaz comments on this and Rune tells him to hold it to the sky. Chaz does this. A brilliant beam of light directly points upwards through the clouds. Chaz asks what's going on, and Rune tells him that Rykos is at the end of the light. Ren calculates the light's trajectory, and Seth begins screaming in pain, clutching his face. He continues well, screaming. Yeah. Rika asks what's wrong. Seth doesn't seem to be in a position to answer. He continues screaming as he's ripped apart from the inside. A moment later, yeah, where yeah. Seth's body stood as a horrifying but familiar figure. Rika determines that it is Dark Force, masquerading as a human. Ren asks if Dark Force can also evolve, but there's no time to answer because the final battle with Dark Force begins.
So, as you defeat it, Dark Force explodes in his usual dramatic way and you can rest assured you won't be seeing this guy again. Rune thinks the yeah. situation is becoming a bit sticky and suggests they go to Rykoros as quickly as possible. Chaz doesn't seem to understand the hurry, but Rune explains the followers of Darkness are already aware of the location of Rykoros since they saw it through Dark Force's eyes before he died. Uh, Ren points dicky. out that they only know... Yep. Ren points out he only knows the location of Rykoros, but he admits that there must be something there that Darkness doesn't want them to have. Chaz says it's best that they get it, and Rika adds that they will have to hurry before they're beaten to it. Ren reports that the direction of Rykoros has been stored in his memory, but the distance is undetermined. Rune determines that they just head towards his aid in the land deal, so Chaz heads to the spaceport. And in this, you find the fourth party. I mean, the, uh, the fourth planet. Rykoros. Because, yeah, Rykoros is a hidden fourth planet in this system. Oh, fuck, I, I see. Oh, it sounds yeah. like... It, it I skipped exactly a cutscene. Like planet... Oh, you're the worst. <laughs> I was gonna say, it sounds exactly like the planet where the creepers would be from, uh, from Minecraft. You know what I mean? They're from another planet? No, they're from... They're from Minecraft, but like, if they were from another planet, they'd be from there. Okay, so you get into the spaceport, Ren confirms that they are on the correct course. Chaz wonders if it's a structure or a satellite like the air castle, but Ren simply responds that if they stay on their current heading, they will soon lead the Algo system. Rune, indicate, Rune insists they have to keep going and Chaz remains astounded. At that moment, the arrow prism flashes and a green planet appears in front of the Landale. Ren announces this and Rune notices that it is not apparent on the radar. Ren informs him the planet is neither Motavia, Dezolus, or Parma, and that the planet is not in his database. It is Chaz who realizes this is Rykros, and they land on this new planet. Arriving inside a strange building, the party outside of the land deal head into a crystal chamber. They walk into a glowing symbol in the center of the floor, and the room around them turns into a starry, deep space backdrop. The image of a galaxy appears below their feet, and a hidden voice welcomes them, calling them protectors. Chaz wonders what's going on, and the source of the voice introduces itself as Laroof of Rykros. It explains that it remains on this planet to pass on the story of the genesis of Algo. Chaz notes that he was right about the planet being Rykros, and Laroof confirms it, stating that this is the fourth planet of the Algo star system. Ren disagrees since there's only supposed to be three, but Rula Roof says that Rykoros is protected by a powerful and invisible barrier to stop any normal beings from seeing or otherwise sensing it. It continues by informing the party that Rykoros' orbit is highly elliptical, as it only passes near Algo every thousand years. Rune recalls the message to Dezoli and Gabe that the arrow prism shows the way when Rykoros returns, and now he knows what it meant by returns. Chaz gets to the point and tells LaRouf they've come to Rykoros to find out about the profound darkness. He asks what it is, why it's causing disasters, and where it is now, and demands LaRouf tells them everything. LaRouf thinks for a moment and says that he will tell all to the courageous protectors who had discovered Rykoros, but they first must perform a task. You know, as if finding it wasn't enough. He informs them that there are two towers on Rykoros called the Courage Tower and the Strength Tower. He tells them to meet with the guardians of these towers and that he will recognize them as protectors when they return. Chas asks if LaRouf is testing them and he replies that it is absolutely necessary. He realizes they have no choice so they announce their departure. Before the party leave, LaRouf finishes by saying they must hurry as the Hand of Darkness is already closing in. And so you go to these towers, you prove your strength, you prove your courage, and there's no real cutscene. So you return to LaRouf and you finally get everything you need to know. So please do not fall asleep on me, Brandon. I am not. <laughs> okay, good. The party will automatically wait, walk up to the regeneration platform. The temple will fade into the starry background and LaRouf will appear. And here's where you finally get everything. It begins Yay. billions of years ago when spiritual life forms split into two lesser beings who began to fight. After a long and terrible battle, there was, a w there was a victor. The winner banished the enemy spiritual life form into another dimension. LaRouf adds that the victorious side was the Great Light, and the defeated one was the Profound Darkness. However, the Great Light feared the Profound Darkness's return and placed a seal over the dimensional portal consisting of three planets orbiting a fixed star. This seal became known as the Algo Star System. So dig that, the planets themselves were seals. That's seals. how badass this son of a bitch is. 
That's kind of cool. The roof continues that the great, the great life distributed protectors between the three tribes of Algo, the Parmanians, the Motavians, and the Dizolians. Unfortunately, there were fluctuations in the strength of the seal, meaning it would be at its weakest every thousand years. As a warning of this phenomenon, the Great Light created Rykros, which would return every thousand years, and himself, Laruf. Rightly, how an invisible planet can be any kind of warning... Oh, Chaz asks how an invisible planet can be any warning, and Laruf continues that the mission would be forgotten by the generation of protectors over a thousand years. He then adds Rykros was meant to break its silence when the seal's final moment came, to remind the protectors of the mission they were born to do. When he asks by the final moment, Laruf explains that throughout time the profound darkness has seethed with animosity and the need for revenge. He adds that once every thousands of years, when the seal is at its weakest, the most intense part of the spirit is able to break through and come into Algo in physical form. This is Dark Force. And Laruf continues. He tells the party every time Dark Force appeared, a courageous person would defeat it and bring about a millennium of peace. However, the profound darkness is patient and eventually managed to destroy the planet Parma, forever destroying a part of the seal. Now, a thousand years later, the profound darkness is seeking to free itself completely. Chaz asks if that's what's happening now, but LaRouf replies it may be. Rika res- questions this response, and LaRouf clarifies that either the profound darkness will free itself completely, or someone will destroy the darkness, rendering the seal meaningless. Chaz knows that someone is them. LaRouf, asks, LaRouf then tells the protector that if the profound darkness escapes, all of Argol, Algol will certainly be destroyed. The only way to prevent this is to go to the darkness dimension and destroy it there. He explains as long as the party has the ring of the stars, they will be able to withstand the strongest part of the darkness. He then tells the party that time is come and to obey the will of the great light by destroying the profound darkness. Fulfill their roles as protector, Chaz disagrees. He asks LaRouf who he thinks he is, insisting that he's not going to fight any mission. You know, for the great hero of the story, he's taking a bit of an attitude right now. Dude. You there, buddy? Yes. <laughs> Boy. Boy, when I said a bedtime story, I didn't mean you could actually, like, fall asleep. Maybe you should, like, stand up. You should, like, stand up. <laughs> okay, so Chaz doesn't like being told what to do. He tells everybody he doesn't like what's going on. And he adds, when Alice died... Rune explained things to him, and Rika tried to lift his spirits, but he still didn't understand. Chaz adds that all he knew was that the person who had looked after him and taught him everything had died. He continues that he would have gladly sacrificed his life for the peaceful repose of Alice's soul, but gradually he learned that people depended on, depend on him to fight. Rune asks if that isn't fine. Chaz replies he can't have the fate of an entire system rest on his shoulders. He also adds that the mission is handed down from the Great Light, and if they dance to its tune, then they're no different from Zeo. Ruin understands why Chaz might think that, and informs him that there's something he wants Chaz to meet. They go to the Esper Mansion, where you find something called the Sword of the Espers. So you head back to Dazolas, head back to that, uh... Monastery thing. Yeah. And so, Chaz goes in alone, and sees a statue... The statue appears, the statue is holding what Chaz supposes to be the sacred sword, Elcidian. Chaz then hears a voice in his head which welcomes him, calling him by name. The voice continues that Chaz is in the place where the spirit of those who fought to protect Algo returned to, and that Elcidian is the sword sheltered by these spirits. The sword tells Chaz to take Elcidian in his hands, at which point he has a vision. He sees a woman fighting Dark Force, followed by images of other people fighting against the darkness and the Algo star system. The vision ends, and the voice confirms that Chaz is the one Rune has selected, and now he understands. An apparition of a girl appears, and tells Chaz that they entrust El City into his care, adding that all their thoughts are in the sword. The voice finishes by saying they will always be with Chaz. Always. He tells them not to worry. He tells them not to worry, and that they can leave it to him. So he leaves the cave with Alcidian. The party's still there, and Rune says that Alcidian promised it would give Chaz its power, and that there's no mistake in his judgment. He then tells Chaz that they should go and save Algo, and Chaz agrees unhesitatingly, adding they will protect all life and free the world of Terra once and for all. 
Suddenly, Rin reports that there's an emergency, that Demi has reported a disaster has erupted on Motavia. Sweet. So, upon, a, upon arriving, you're greeted by Han, Grizz, and Demi, who are waiting at the airport. Spaceport. Chaz acknowledges them all. Han notices that Chaz seems to have become stronger than, since they've last met. Grizz says he was scolded by Pana, but he came anyway. And Demi agrees that the system is finally stabilized, so now she can go with them. So this is the one thing that you can control. You have a party of like three people, or four people. Now you can choose your fifth member. Whoa. And then you finally realize that there is a massive hole in the world now. And that life around the Literally area has started hole. dying. There's no gas or radiation, but life hole. is still being absorbed by it. It is a very powerful black energy wave. They, they, they determine that it is the profound darkness finally opening the door and making its way to the other making its way from the other dimension. This is the final preparation for the big showdown where you get to choose the fifth member of your party and your strategy will change depending on who you bring. Oh, and wow. then you finally fight the profound... Uh, well, you can choose Han, Grizz, Demi, Raja, or Kira. Mm, probably one of the last three. Demi, Raja, or Kira. <laughs> yeah. So, then you find... You make your way through all this shit, and through an amazing... Uh, an amazing looking background, you finally find the profound darkness. Rune confirms that this is an, an emanation of it. That he feels its anger and hatred for all life, and that they must defeat it, and it must not be allowed to reach Algo. Rika notes that the portal's not completely open, and they must take advantage of this opportunity. So you make your way through, and the final battle with darkness begins. So you fight the darkness, and you defeat it. And then Woo. it morphs, and you have to fight it again, Woo. and then it morphs. And then finally, this is its final form, and you defeat it. Woo. The profound darkness is no more, but the party now have a new problem. The force holding the dimensional door open is gone, and Ren reports, feel, reports sensing a time warp. Rika asks what they're supposed to do when Alcidian begins to shine. Rune realizes that it's protecting them from the destructive force of the profound darkness's death. A short while later, everyone is back on the surface of Motavia watching the sunrise.
Rune announces it is over. Chaz agrees. Rika adds that they were able to keep Algo safe. Ren reports the departure and preparations are complete for the Landale, so everyone can be returned to their planet. Uh, so and they saved Chaz's that, uh, planet by saving this planet? Uh, yeah, they save all the planets by go by pretty much going to the hole in, Mo in Motavia, so basically it ends where it began. And Kira right. suggests that uh, the others should visit Dezolus once in a while, but Raja points out they don't have a spaceship and that flapping their arms won't get them far. Kira and Raja say goodbye. Demi reports that she will go back to Zelen to assist Ren and bids farewell to Chaz. She says eventually the time will come when she and Ren will become unnecessary to Algo, but until that time they will complete their duties. Ren adds that he, after he's taking the others to Dezolus, he will go back to Zelen. Chaz notices uh -huh. that Rika's missing. Ren tells them that she's already waiting on the land deal, adding that parting must be difficult for her. Chaz doesn't seem too happy. And this is really like a nice touching cutscene, which I'll have to describe since you never saw the game or will watch the videos. Ren finally says goodbye to Chaz and assures him that they will meet again. He, Demi, Raja, Kira head to the land deal and Ren tells them and Ren tells Rika they're leaving. They all get on board, fly off into the distance. Grizz says that they're gone. On board, Rika tries to speak to Ren, but Ren knows what she's thinking. He tells her the road she chooses will be painful and difficult, but she is their hope. Ren tells Rika she must be strong and live with pride. She understands and thanks him. Back on the surface, Grizz tells the others he's got to go back to Tanoe. He thanks Chaz, adding that he's learned a lot from the trip. Han decides to return to the academy. He says he's become disgusted with the people there, but he must learn to transform his feelings into inner strength. He says goodbye to Chaz and tells them he will always be proud to have fought beside him. Grin and Han Lee, Grizz and Han leave. Rune turns to Chaz and tells him that he guesses it's finally goodbye. He continues that although the battle against the ultimate fiend is over, his mission as Lutz must continue. He must watch over all of Algo and that he's still lacking in training and experience. Which to me sounds like a cop-out, because if you destroyed the ultimate evil, I think your training is complete. Also, like, that he sounds does. to me like they're just leaving the game open for the fifth thing. Yeah, you know, they say that, but... Chaz asks if they will ever meet again, Rune replies that it is unlikely. Chaz begins to tear up, but Rune tells him that Chaz can now live without anyone's help. And then here comes the big moment. The land deal appears above them. Rika standing at the doorway. Chaz and Rika call out to each other, then Rika takes one last look at Ren. With tears in her eyes, she jumps off the Landale and into the arms of Chaz. Rune bids farewell to them both and walks off into the distance. Under his breath, Chaz says his last goodbye to Rune and thanks him, as the Landale soars off into space. And then a quote appears on the screen. The long battle is over. We were able to free ourselves from the terrible curse of Yore. To the souls of those who sacrificed their lives for Algo, rest in peace, from person to person, from age to age. As long as memories last, we will not forget the sacrifice that has been made. Han goes back to teach at the academy. Grizz and, Gr Grizz and Pana live peacefully back in Tanoe. Raja continues living leisurely, spending a lot of his time at a bar. And Kira <laughs> maintains her studies and prayer at the Esper Mansion. Demi and Ren work together aboard Zelen, keeping Algo under control, and Rune watches from afar as he wanders in the wilderness. Chaz and Rika make a life together and finally find true happiness. The story concludes. The eons old struggle between light and dark has ended, and now the curtain rises on a new age. Credits roll. Finn. Woo! So, so Brandon, Chaz what did you think of the game? <laughs> Holy fuck, that game can suck so many dicks. Oh my god. <laughs> and there's how many of those? Like, how big is the series? Oh, well, that ended the uh, original series. But uh, the series itself has gone on. Let's see if I can... Oh, because it has gone on to... Spin-offs like Fantasy Star Online, Fantasy Star wow. Universe, Fantasy Star Portable, Fantasy Star Zero, and the latest one is Fantasy Star Nova, which came out in 2014. So that's nine different versions. How many times do you think I fell asleep during that conversation? At least like six? <laughs> There's more versions <laughs> of this fucking game and the story and whatever than, than I could fall asleep during. 
That's nuts. Oh, and dig this. The series has been out on Dreamcast, Game Boy Advance, GameCube, Game Gear, iOS, Windows, DS, PlayStation 2, Portable, Vita, Sega Genesis, Master System, Sega Mega CD, Sega Saturn, Virtual Console, Xbox, and Xbox 360. And you know uh, what happened? Uh, At, you know what happened after I beat this game, Fantasy Star 4? Guess what happened? What happened? My, la- my latest game arrived in the mail. Fantasy Star Universe. Cut. And it still has those fucked up names for like Foy, Megiddo, and uh, same like healing items like Monomate, Trimate, Dimate. It's still system. Oh, so... my God. Fuck. Fantasy Star Universe sucks so fucking much. The game is broken on every fundamental level. It is made to hate the player. Like when you go to a save menu, you know, what would you do when you normally save something? You press the A button. Tell them, yes, I want to save here. It would save. Yeah. And then what would you do to get out of the save menu? You press the B yeah, button, circle. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you hit the back button. Not this time. You press that and fuck all happens. You have to manually choose to exit the save menu. And huh. it is just an indication, like, you need to synthesize items, but they're so far away, you can't, you can't upgrade any enemy, you can't upgrade items you're holding on to. So anytime you wonder... Can I upgrade this? First of all, it'll tell you, like, oh, this is made by a different company. Like, you can't upgrade your weapon because it's made by, like, a, a different manufacturer. So you can't just upgrade it. And even if it did, oh, you're holding the item, so you have to go back into the menu, unequip it, and then go back and talk to everybody. Everything is made to hate your fucking time. I can't say enough bad about Fantasy Star Universe. Decent story. The voice acting is terrible. But... I mean, just mechanically, it is Wait, just you mean so they fucking have audio awful. dialogue tracks. People read what they're thinking out loud. <laughs> In the universe one, but it's not worth it. This game is better mechanically than universe. Yeah, Fantasy Star Four is better mechanically than uh, universe is. But yeah, as a guy who loves RPGs like Final Fantasy and stuff like that, I think I'll take. Like, now that we're done the game, uh, yeah, my substitutions would be any fucking other RPG. Like, yeah. as far as RPGs goes, this this drags on. I like the, the comic cutscenes. I thought that was a very nice thing. But, you know, the game is just so long. Yep. And it I was, was done with this. Quite so. long. What about you? Uh, I have you... a substitution. Wait. All right. Uh, I would say just go ahead and get Kindle uh, or whatever and <laughs> just have the app that, that you can read a book on. And then you're good to go. You're fine. You fucking read Star Trek. <laughs> you read Star Wars. You're good to go. You don't have to do anything. There's no extra push A for this bullshit. You just swipe the page and you can read the next part. It's so good. Also, Comixology... If you want, like, comic book style stuff, because, you know, just plain text, because you're like me and plain text sucks, just go to Comixology. Download that app, and then you can read all the comics that you fucking want. Yeah, so, uh, Ben? This game, Fuck this you. game would be better with no game at all and just the story, but in a better format so that I could actually read the story and give a fuck about it. Yeah, Ben, suck a dick. I love you, but I hate you so much. Also, uh, <laughs> I want to I want to harken back to uh, Zio's fort and the quicksand bridge thing. Um, <laughs> so Zio, you're awfully invested for a guy that couldn't be bothered to play this game. I'm I'm real fucking mad about this situation. So Zio obviously wanted the quicksand moat to like protect him, right? It was a natural defense, right? But the, the city uh, no, it was just next to natural. it. What? What? Go ahead. Well, it wasn't like around the castle. It was just like between. It was on the one range. side of the castle. Yeah. Yeah. It was between his fort and the next city over, right? Yeah, but you could still take the long way on foot by going like yeah, through caves through, and mountain ranges mountain. and shit. Yeah. So, effectively, his idea is, like, it's a small amount of defense 
if an army wanted to attack me, they'd have to all go through that fucking mountain, and surely some of them would die on the trek, and then they would be, they would be cut off. They wouldn't be able to send any more shit. So I'd be easily like I'd I'd be foolish to build a bridge on this quicksand, right? But if that town beside him decided, okay, we're tired of him doing shit, it's time for us to launch our military at him. It would take nothing to, you know, like, uh, what do they call like suspension bridges, like with a triangle where you like, you basically, are you looking, are you looking at the video right now? I'm looking at you, yes. Look at, look at the video right now. Yeah, okay. So, fuck, it's lagging. So you take like a bridge, right? You put the one across yeah. the bottom, and it's like right there, right? And then you go up top, and you make the little triangles. Boop, 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 boop. You know yeah. what I mean? And then I you put like a shorter one. Bridges. A shorter one on top of that. I'm saying take that whole situation. Yeah, this cable's connecting make it, the points. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying take that whole situation, make it a wood, then flip it upside down, and stick it in the quicksand. It's called a bridge. <laughs> it's, it's called a bridge, but I mean like... It seems like it's so fucking difficult for these people, but like that you couldn't make the suspension bridge style because it wouldn't work, and if it well, broke, then you'd be they're fucked. In a, they're in a but desert, if you made it the way, so I think they're short on wood. They have a town. They, Brandon, Brandon's like, got that perfect face of like I fucking nailed them. Well, I was thinking that too. To be honest, I was like, so what kind of resources does this town have? Let's make it out of the shittiest resources like, that they have. I think it's like stone and shit. It's a desert. Honestly, I was going to say, look, if they wanted to, they could just mill a bunch of rocks into powder and then go over to that fucking like quicksand ravine and just pour all the powder in, and then that would solve solidify. the problem too. Yeah. Yeah, it would solidify that shit. That's a good idea, but yeah, yeah these people are fucking stupid. Yeah. So, oh, so... I think we got to give like a little narrative like this pot like this like again fuck you Ben because you like you not only did you nearly put this podcast to a friggin halt we haven't recorded an episode in about two months and this is and like just trying to get this done has put a tremendous strain on our friendship you nearly <laughs> killed the podcast you nearly, I nearly killed, killed the Mike. dynamic duo you nearly killed the dynamic duo of Brandon and you Mike nearly made me kill so, Mike <laughs> Eat a bag of spicy dicks. <laughs> spicy ghost dicks. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that being said, do you have... Uh, I guess this is my angle, actually. Do you... Uh, do I have anything that I could compare this food-wise to? I would say... Like, if I got told on Monday that on Tuesday... I have to do a party for like 150 people and they're all vegan, gluten-free, something vampires or something. That would be the equivalent of what this is to me. When he's like, yep, just play this entire RPG. Also, you don't have any of the equipment that you need initially. You have to download a whole other emulator, which is a pain in your ass and everything else. God damn it. This was such a... This was such a pain in the cunt. I mean, I couldn't... I could only play this thing on my DS. Like, I probably could have downloaded a regular emulator from my computer, but I wanted to play it on the go, because that's where I play my Nintendo games. So, the emulator... They stopped developing it after the DS. So, they never made it for the large screen. Only a regular DS screen. So, which means you have to use the shoulder buttons to scan the image back and forth, meaning you're only seeing, like, the middle 80%. And there's 10% on either side that you just don't see unless you, like, scroll. It's like physically looking through the eyes of Chaz when you're in a battle. That's hilarious. That's too funny, so, actually. And it was constantly letterboxed. Because, again, because it was made for a DS screen, I've got all this black bar on the side. Which would be perfect for displaying the whole fucking game. But no, I'm viewing the game through a slit that I have to turn sideways to see everything. It's like being trapped in a tank. You know what I hate? I hate Ben. <laughs> <laughs> yep, this threatened to destroy our friendship and the podcast. And yep. it's gotten to the point where, in fact, we may even have to take on a third host 
just in case Brandon eventually hates me or decides he'd rather work and make money than waste time with me for free. So, in, in future... <laughs> well, truth is, we are taking on a third host, right? Yes, we are. Fan of the uh, Playing With Power podcast, <laughs> Ivan will be joining us in the very near Ivan, future. A steady, steady Patreon donator, and he'll be, he's earned his way into the bracket by pestering the hell out of Mike, <laughs> which is the same way I did it. <laughs> so, now he's going to be part of Taste Test. He would be I want to, I like, I, we, we're going to have like a little interview kind of like handover kind of deal, I think, at a different point. But uh, like uh, just for my own curiosity sake, does Ivan have, yeah, does does Ivan have any um, cooking experience? Or are you going to graduate to be the chef and he's going to be the game connoisseur? I think we're going to have to grill him on that later. <laughs> That's sad. God, I can't wait to make somebody else suffer with your jokes. <laughs> Jesus. That'll make it worth it for me. I mean, the listeners already suffer with me. So. But anyway. So we'll be getting a little interview kind of deal with, with Ivan going for our a little next halfway ep- episode, I think. We'll, well do our, that. Our, little ne- our next episode where we officially introduce Dot Ivan not only as like as our first guest... And possibly an interim host, depending if he passes the uh, the audition. Which, of course, we will be doing live, because why not? So Cause why not? What? Because we need content. Yeah. Because we need content. Are you looking at the, the camera right now? Yeah, it looks like you're threatening me with a pair of garden shears. Or <laughs> I'm very menacingly holding a pair of garden shears. Oh, wait, are those tin snips or garden so, shears? I assume that they're garden shears because I found them out here, and they look like they would not go through metal super well. Well, tin snips are made to cut, like, very like thin sheets of tin. I know what tin snips are. These don't look like tin snips. Okay. Okay, well, I'm freaking tired and hot, so... I don't know. Post Post a snap of this video... And we'll ask our viewers what this looks like to them. Okay, one, two. All right, so without further ado, or wait, even... wait, 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 take take another one, take another one, take another one, take another one. All right, damn it, you're you're brain dragging this out. Quit yep. smiling at me like that. You shouldn't be proud of yourself. I'll do whatever I want, Mike. You can't stop me. Yes, I can. This has been the taste test. Possibly, here. possibly Brandon's final list. episode on the taste test. So definitely not. <laughs> I'm Mike, and I've been Brandon, and you've been joining us on the taste test. Ciao. Ben and boom.
back with another episode of Fuck Me Sideways. <laughs> uh, can you use that? I'm asking the producer. Hey, can we use that? Ted. Yeah, it's good. We're good. He's got a thumbs up. Or his prosthetic is broken again. <laughs> Man, he lost those hands. That was tragic. You should not be that close to train tracks, though. Ted? Ted? Get away from... Don't go back near those train tracks. We've talked about this. Anyway, guys, back to the show.